welcome to the Love Bite Plus panel discussion. And this panel is meant to uh, inform everyone about what we call the Love Bite, um, alien interference in human love relationships, and the whole dynamic of interference in relationships from some kind of paranormal way. And we're going to talk a lot about what this is, what the symptoms are, how it manifests in your life, and many different aspects of this with several panelists today. And so I want to go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Eve Lorgan, and I'm the author of two books, um, The Love Bite, Alien Interference and Human Love Relationships, and The Dark Side of Cupid, uh, which is about love affairs, the supernatural, and energy vampirism. So really this panel is based on what's in those two books and what we've learned over the years in research with what I call anomalous trauma, how um, love relationships in particular have been uh, manipulated or orchestrated, influenced, disrupted, or set up in some way by the sources that we deem to be either ETs, aliens, or sometimes humans, black magicians, sorcerers, or interdimensional beings. So it's actually quite a bit uh, and this is all really defined in my books pretty well. So today, um, I'm here to talk about this, um, but there's also several of us joining today. And I'd like to introduce just um, briefly the people who are going to be here in the discussion. Um, James Bartley, is, as you know, is a colleague of mine that we've worked for many years um, doing alien abduction research and support groups together. Um, and we've been doing this for something like over 20 years now. Now, I, I stopped counting years, but, um, and then also Tom Montauk and Carissa Conte. They've done a lot of their own research over the years. Uh, and we have Bernard Gunther, and um, he's had a lot of experiences himself. And um, Arella Eliora is someone who's joining us, um, who's had experience, personal experience with the Love Bite as well, and has started her own research in many aspects. And Laura Leon, my colleague, has also done research, had personal experience. In fact, all of us here have had our own personal experiences related to, quote, the love bite in some capacity. So that's why we're all here. Not only have we had personal experience, but we've done our, our own individual research, which really goes into many different areas that's very relevant today. So I guess what I'll do is I'll go ahead and start off with um, really defining quote, what is the love bite? And, and I know it sounds funny. It's a funny term. It actually started uh, many years ago uh, as the alien love bite. And it was people who've had multiple alien abduction histories who realized over their course of their lives that they had relationships that were being uh, manipulated or orchestrated or actually set up by the aliens that were visiting them, or we call them alien handlers. And so that that phrase actually stuck, the alien love bite, and then we later really just called it the love bite. But in actuality, we actually learned this from people who had multiple alien visitation histories or alien abductions, and those kind of people had those kinds of reports that their relationships were definitely not only being set up, but they were being orchestrated or manipulated or broken off. And so over the years, what I realized is not just this subpopulation is actually experiencing this phenomena, um, there's many people who experience some kind of interference in the relationship from what I call a paranormal factor, for lack of a better term, or what we call a third-party entity type of visitation, which could be a type of interdimensional being, but it could also be an alien or an ET, um, it could be a military, uh, it could be some MK Ultra handlers, it could be a sorcerer, it could be demons, it could be angels. So there's actually a lot of different kinds of beings and modes in which this can happen. So I guess what I can do is just give you the general um, symptoms of what this is so people could recognize it as opposed to, let's say, a quote, a regular relationship or a relationship where this is not happening. And, and we'll talk more in detail about all of that. So I'm just reading some bullet points. This is actually based on my book, Love Bite. And the definition and symptoms are basically um, alien abduction history um, or ET contact or sometimes they just call it visitations because they can be both physical and what we call astral or interdimensional. Uh, bonding scenarios of various kinds recalled in abduction-related dreams with a person who is what we call the targeted partner. 
And sometimes several times this happens under different circumstances in trauma or relational, sexual, and also what we call astral sexual unions or meldings. These kinds of things are remembered often in dreams, but sometimes they're remembered very distinctly as an abduction event. Uh, a, love, a love obsession is like one of the huge symptoms because that tends to follow after these bondings take place on these other more subtle levels. So a love obsession in one or both partners can take place after one of the abductions or astral dreams, for example. Uh, switching off or psychic unplugging of one partner, leaving the other unrequited and pining away in yearning, obsession, grief. And this is something that was clearly observed as part of the whole scenario of the love bite. And Barbara Bartholick, one of my colleagues, helped me understand this in greater detail. The, the switch, switching off and what we call the psychic unplugging was a big part of that. Um, general emotional turmoil during the drama of the love obsession. Increased alien abductions or visitations during the duration of the love obsession. Uh, stage managed dreams and virtual reality scenarios trainings with the other partner and we're going to go into detail about what all this is also uh, supernatural and paranormal events and also a lot of synchronicities uh, regarding the targeted partner which suggests that they are the one or the soulmate love twin flame kind of thing um, oftentimes kundalini activation can happen with that and it also also can increase those people's psychic abilities as a, as a result and then, you know, when the switching off occurs and there's a lot of drama, what we'll notice is the exhaustion and a persistent sense that one is still psychically connected to the love bite partner, even after the relationship or obsession is over. There's still a psychic link going on. Uh, emotional and telepathic linking with the love bite partner during the bonding phase and sometimes afterwards. And like I said, the psychic abilities could increase during this phase as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and during the discussion, we'll kind of talk about what are the reasons why, quote, the aliens are doing this, or in cases of what I call the military abduction scenario or the MILABs, there's also reasons for this. And there's different kinds of love bites, which we'll talk about in more detail. So I'm not going to go through all the reasons because we'll discuss that as part of the overall discussion. And before I go off into saying any more, um, the dark side of Cupid the reason why I wrote the book was because so many people were having similar symptoms as, quote, the alien love bite. But over the years, these people didn't necessarily remember themselves to have alien visitations or abductions or UFO sightings, but they had a lot of the same symptoms of what I actually recognized later to be um, the dynamic of energy vampirism and the high emotional drama, the, you know, the emotional highs and the crashing lows and the sense of being watched, a sense of being under a spell, a love obsession. So I wrote a book um, called The Dark Side of Cupid, which actually describes that in a, in a different way, which goes more into the dynamics of when this is happening, there's, there's an energy vampirism factor. Sometimes there's a psychopathology factor with one partner, for example, who may be a narcissist or borderline personality disorder. Or in most cases, um, there's some kind of third party entity around that is actually manipulating or influencing the relationship in some way. And in cases where there was overt awareness that one person was actually hosted or possessed by some kind of interdimensional being, such as a reptilian or a demon or a snake being or any number of beings that have been described. And that's actually in my book, The Dark Side of Cupid, with images of that. So anyway, so this could be interdimensional beings that not even, they're not even connected to the alien abduction phenomena, but there is a, you know, sometimes there's a demonic element or an interdimensional element that's really responsible behind the scenes engineering this whole energy vampirism thing. So that's actually huge. And um, actually channeling pay, plays a big part in this with their, if the spirit guides are some kind of interdimensional being that's actually acting as a energy parasite or a psychic vampire kind of thing. So I think what I'll do is, um, and I want to go ahead and just say a little bit about Barbara Bartholick, because she was actually the one who really helped me understand this whole alien love bite thing. And I would have never really known as fast as I did if it hadn't been for Barbara Bartholick, um, because I was running a support group in the early 90s with James Bartley um, in Fallbrook, California. 
And during that time, many of us in the group were undergoing the same uh, obsession kind of situations where we were being in these uh, abduction scenarios or what we call stage managed dreams, where the targeted partner would be there and there would be different scenarios being played out for how we responded to a particular person. So it's actually the aliens or the handlers who were responsible for using this, whatever this technology is, was actually engineering a lot of these love obsessions that they were all going on at the same time. So luckily, um, it played out more favorably because Barbara Bartholik was able to help us understand what was happening and that she had seen this for years, that the aliens have been doing this kind of thing for years and especially the reptilians. So, um, and also, Dr. Carla Turner, who was um, mentored by Barbara Bartholik, who also wrote several books, was one who brought that out into the uf ufology community and abduction community with um, the Ted Rice case called Masquerade of Angels. And in that book, um, I actually took sequences of that uh, case study and the Love Bite portion is in my Love Bite book. So in, in Ted's case, he was bonded with um, Actually, it was alien greys who were responsible for, for some of the bonding he remembered. But he thought they were angels in his first screen memory until they got through the, the screen layers of the memories and found out that they were alien greys doing this with him and another woman that he went to school with and he was 14. So anyway, um, Barbara helped us understand that there's so much more to this. And, and a lot of what people remember from their alien experiences may not even be the actual experience that there could be screen memories of something much more pleasant, which is part of the programming that could take place with some of these love bites. And that's what we've realized over the years that there's this whole syndrome that plays out that could be a result of, of another kind of programming actually. So Without further ado, I think I will just hand it over to James Bartley, where he can just kind of take it from here on, you know, his understanding of what he learned from Barbara Bartholik and his own experiences, and we'll just open it up to discussion. So I'll just be quiet now and let James take the floor. Thank you for that introduction, Evie. My name is James Bartley, and I myself have had alien abduction experiences. Investigating alien abductions, military abductions, and various aspects of the uh, UFO situation for 25 some odd years. Evie and I are longtime colleagues. Uh, years ago, she and I had run a support group, and around the same time, we all began to notice that a number of us were going through this alien love bite situation. And without going into too much detail, I, I will just touch on, on the bare essentials of it so we can keep the uh, discussion flowing. Our emotional uh, energetic resonators, we, we as human beings have an emotional body and we are by nature emotional, empathic, and these archontic negative beings strive to shunt us in, in the lower end of the emotional vibrational spectrum. One of the key ways they do this is through emotional energetic harvesting and the alien love bite the dark side of cupid the drama of the love obsession as barbara bartholick uh, described it is a key facet we were fortunate at the time to have the the wise counsel of barbara bartholick to help us through this uh, very critical period of time I can say that, that in, in my personal case, Barbara had helped me out a lot because she explained the inner dynamics and provided a conceptual framework for what the alien love by it is. There is a lot of denial which an individual going through this must first overcome uh, because our emotions are, are dear to our hearts. They, they, in many ways, define us. As, as sentient human emotional beings and to have our emotions used against us in this fashion, especially in regards to uh, our seeming connection to another person we feel a strong attraction to. To me, that's about as low, low a blow as it can get. And so uh, just wanted to point out that the seminal role that Barbara Barthick played in, in providing a, a conceptual framework for all of us that were going through this, we began to implement her teachings in our support group and individually with each person in our group that was having these issues. So uh, I think that that's enough of a background for me at the moment. So if anyone else would want to uh, pick up from that. 
Um, I think we'll just go ahead and have each person do a, a short introduction before we launch into more in-depth discussion. So um, maybe Tom and Carissa can go ahead and introduce themselves. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, so I'm the author of Montauk.net, you know, and that's where I have a bunch of articles up there about all sorts of fringe topics from the alien agenda to the matrix control system, um, spirituality, synchronicity, forbidden science, forbidden history, and all this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I also had alien uh, experiences, which I consciously remember without any sort of hypnosis sessions or anything. Uh, and starting in my teens, I started having some military abduction related symptoms as well. And that's because my stepdad was in the military and because I took certain standardized tests in high school, which kind of put me on the map as far as uh, intelligence and, you know, things like that. So, um, and over the years, what I've been trying to do is correspond with literally thousands of people over the past two decades, getting their experiences, their insights, and taking this entire body of data and uh, trying to boil it down to the bottom line and then package it in a, in a clear and concise way with the world so that they can kind of make up their own mind about what's going on. So that's, that's, what, that's what, um, what I'm doing. Um, I'm Carissa Conti, and I'm the author of a website called intoworlds.net. It's in the number two worlds.net. And it's uh, basically a website kind of encompassing a, a wide range of fringy topics, um, everything from abductions in my labs um, and mind control um, subjects, as well as synchronicity, parallel timelines, reality glitches, and um, hyperdimensional interference. And it's all coming from firsthand experience. So it's articles and free books available to people where I'm writing from personal experience. So I don't write about anything that I haven't experienced or which I don't know something about. Um, and so I kind of use my experiences as a platform to you know, put these subjects out there and then try to get to the bottom of what's happening here. And, you know, what is this place where, you know, what is this reality and what's really happening here? Because what we've been told is, is not what it is. And so, and, and I use my, my experiences to try to like introduce these topics and um, propose theories and ideas and, and just kind of get to the bottom of what's happening in this reality. Thank you. Does Bernard like to introduce himself? Mute. Okay. Hey, my name is Bernard Gunther, and uh, I have a blog called Veil of Reality, which is uh, I've had for many, many years, and I just share my research and experiences relating to different topics, spirituality, psychology, even history, but also the hyperdimensional uh, matrix control system. And in my personal journey, um, I grew up in, in, in Germany and moved to the United States in 1994. Uh, to pursue a music career, to study drums and percussion because it helped me just to deal with my emotions and to express myself because I never really could fit, in, fit into the world. And that really started my path of questioning. And literally, by my, my own suffering forced me to, you know, figure myself out, to ask questions, to question the reality of this world and official culture. And the, the more I questioned, the more I was seeking. Eventually, I came across the UFO topic. Right. And um, at first, for me, you know, the whole UFO topic is such a huge swamp. <laughs> and what I realized that most people have this assumption that it's a, this nuts and bolts approach, that these are, um, you know, physical aliens from a physical planet and physical spaceships, like a Star Trek scenario visiting Earth and whatnot. But, you know, it was. Actually, I came across Tom's work, you know, over like over 10 years ago, which introduced me more to the hyperdimensional aspect and then also got into Carla Turner's work and your work and um, started writing more about it on my blog and also produced a um, UFO documentary with a friend, which exposed more the hyperdimensional um, aspect of, of the UFO phenomena and the abduction phenomena, the dark side, so to speak, right? And ever since after that, release of that video four years ago and, and you know my work being more public I experienced high strangeness occurrences in my life and my relationships changed which had had the, um, the imprint of of a dark set of qubit not too much alien love bite because I 
don't I don't really can relate to the typical abduction, you know, characteristics, which doesn't mean I haven't been abducted. I don't know. It could be all <laughs> we don't know that, right? So, but that has been quite a ride over the past four years. And um and uh speaking more out about it seemed to have attracted some sort of attention towards me with these kind of attacks, working through others and getting myself into some of these alien love by type relationships. And um, in my own work, I'm also was led to the healing arts. So I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, be it through body work or also holistic coaching. And I've noticed over the years, especially now, that's why I'm really happy we're doing this uh, round table. More and more people are becoming aware of this topic. I actually open to talk about it and share their experiences, vulnerabilities. They seek help because it cannot be these relationship issues they have, what they encounter cannot be explained through normal psychology or regular just relationship stuff because it has this, uh, it's, you know, anomaly, this paranormal um, characteristics to it. So, yeah, in that sense, that's, that's basically my story. And I feel this is really, really important that we have this round table to really help people to, you know, with this knowledge and information. That's great. Thank you. Um, Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Laura Leon, and um, I have a website that I've just started. And, and the premise of that are the keys towards our sovereignty that will aid us in battling all of these interferences um, that we have all, in one way or another, experienced and or are victims of. So, um, how I came into this all is uh, because I am a longtime abductee, my lab from the get-go. So I came in with the consciousness and was targeted at a young age and um, have had to survive a lot of massive interference um, and experiences which couldn't be blocked from my memory. So, um, not to mention the medical uh, proof related to two implant removals, surgeries that had to take place with no um, scientific explanation. Um, the list is, is large. And I think just like everyone here, we have background in personally um, experiencing the love bite and or the dark side of Cupid or both. <laughs> together because uh, sometimes they go hand in hand. Um, this led me into a deep passion into uh, what I call the anomalous forensic uh, psychological um, profiling because I realized that they profile us. When I say they, we, I mean, it can be the aliens, the, the, the my lab aspect. It can be the all of the various um, interfering forces that are at work profile us. And based on those profiles, they set us up. So I, I ended up um, going to university for psychology, um, sociology, anthropology, uh, just to have a deeper basis and understanding into these psychological dynamics that they implant in us and groom us in exactly to have us land right in a love bite, right in a dark side of Cupid, right in the entire situation of a setup. So um, the, the passion really is, is like all of us, it, it's from anywhere from abductions, uh, the understanding of how these black ops operate, uh, the demonic realms, the spiritual battle against um, amnesia, the cognitive uh, struggle that we have with all of the interference that has been put in place to keep us from ever reaching any real answers in the truth. So all of us come by all of this through a great deal of experience and struggle and research and connecting and uh, I'm just proud to be a part of this uh, experience. And um, yeah, my aspect is really to go into a deeper understanding of these anomalous psychological setups that, um, that are groomed 
for for this. Thanks. Yeah, that was wonderful. I mean, you said it well, because it, there is so much to this and we're learning more and more all the time. So, um, and then we'd like to introduce um, Arella Eliora. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thank you, Ibi. Uh, my name is Arella. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to share my experiences with you. And I really appreciate to have been included in this, in this panel. Uh, I'm a French Mexican based in Latin America and uh, I have a lot of also interaction with Spain. And I basically started all this research some years ago when I really got swept into the New Age movement. And uh, well, I can testify how dangerous the New Age indoctrination really is because um, I felt for, me for many of its programs and then I started questioning them. And I was able to get out of it after two years or, of being very heavily into the New Age teaching. I was a Reiki master, I got into several healing modalities like uh, Theta Healing, Access Consciousness, Tarot Reading, Kabbalah, all sorts of meta metaphysic things that uh, they teach in the New Age. And uh, well, I had a lot of psychic activity back then and I do have memories of abductions. Um, I don't think they were actually physical, but they were astral. And I remember the experiences uh, of being implanted by, by entities, by beings. I started channeling information uh, from uh, entities I used to call my guides, who presented them themselves as ETs, positive ETs. And they were saying things to me about the universe, the cosmos. And at the same time, I started experiencing love bites and dark side of the Cupid scenarios. And they basically tried to stage me to be with a black magician. And uh, they were presenting him as the twin flame. So basically, this, this is how I came to all this research. Um, I was very involved also in the Twin Flame communities uh, in English and in Spanish, both. And I knew most of the gurus and the healers related to Twin Flames. And I even created a group where I, I had thousands of people already, especially ladies from Latin America and Spain. And they were all sharing their stories and, uh, well, talking about their Twin Flames and everything. But as time went by, um, the group really transformed into some kind of research because every day I was getting weird stories from the members saying what was happening to their lives, to the, to the connections. And uh, I started uh, seeing that they were really devastated. They were very deceived. They were confused. They didn't understand what was going on. And um, I started to think that there was something that was really not right. Something was, was off. So um, when I started trying to find answers to my situation and also this lady's situation, I found your website, Eve, and uh, that basically started my own research. And now I have come to, to the conclusion that uh, the Twin Flame program from the New Age is part of an agenda, maybe either to bring people together by these entities for their purpose, or to disrupt or bring down a person they know in the future could be um, uh, researching or exposing them. Um, but currently I, I run a blog and a Facebook page and a YouTube community in Spanish. It's called Camino al Regreso del Balance. And I'm trying to support the people who are basically very much in the program of the Twin Flames and uh, try to realize what is going on with them. And um, I just recently also with my partner launched uh, an English uh, blog also called The Way of Balance. And we're trying to, to help people deprogram not only by the new age, but also by all this uh, indoctrination uh, regarding twin flames. That's awesome. Um, you've got a lot of experience. And uh, as we said, you know, there's so much to this that we're starting to figure out through um, what we're seeing is like a kind of programming that's happening on um, subtle levels and sometimes really overt levels from different um, beings. Sometimes it's human. Sometimes we, it, maybe it's an MK Ultra thing or a, you know, a alphabet soup agency thing. But there's definitely beings involved on an interdimensional level that is no doubt in my mind. It's it's not something that we're just making up. It, it's real. I think one of the things that I wanted to add before we just kind of got into more of a discussion was um, some of the reasons, at least for the love bite, that I hypothesized as uh, because many people wanted to know what that was, especially in the early days of ufology and abduction research. They really were more um, interested in what we they call the hybrid breeding program, 
and that kind of thing. And I know that that's part of what happens in the alien abduction and alien visitation syndrome, that there's this hybridization thing going on. But what we realize is that that always, that didn't necessarily take place when two people were orchestrated to be together in a relationship. And oftentimes they were married people, let's say, who were married to other partners. And there was not necessarily a, a child or a pregnancy as a result of the relationship. So what I actually put together about six, five or six reasons why this could be happening. And I'll just go through it briefly and then we can talk about more of that in, in length if we want to as part of the discussion. So one of the first reasons that most people thought was to put people together for the genetic lines to have children um, and sometimes alien human hybrid creations from streamlined altered genetic combinations, which I think they do in terms of, you know, streamlining certain genetic combinations. Um, but more often than not, what we really noticed was what I call the emotional, sexual, and life force harvesting energies to feed the aliens who are essentially energy vampires. And that's what Barbara Bartholick knew right off the bat. Um, the reptilians in particular were much more blatant in the way they were doing this. Another reason is to observe the genetic expression from strong obsessional bonding, even with other sexual partners or siring children, as in what we call the tele telegony theory. And there's not much really known about that, but it's basically that DNA can be imprinted in the woman's offspring from one of her original lovers that was a very, maybe the first lover, or the most powerful lover in her life. And then even if she had children later with another partner, that child may have characteristics from the original lover. So even though it wasn't their child. So I'm thinking there's something like that going on in the obsessive aspect, because in, in these love bites, you know, the element of obsession and soul bonding is very strong. And then uh, also what we learned with um, people who having military and alien abduction combination experiences or sometimes individually or um, together, what I call my lab operations, um, two tantric pairs or twin pairs of quote abductees or my labs can be used together to maximize their psychic abilities um, or this, what I call the psi ability output for special occult operations. Uh, mind control operations in their alter personalities, for example. Uh, tantric pairs can share information and intelligence and transfer this telepathically via tantric sexual union or have telepathic communication due to the strong soul bonding that they have. And that's actually very common, um, the telepathic communication and downloading of mind files that takes place. And there's no trace, right? So that's a perfect intel operation of gathering and transmitting information. Uh, sometimes a reptilian being has sexual relations with the MyLab operative to activate their kundalini initially. And then after that, um, this, uh, this MyLab person, they are sent out on mind control ops with their expanded psychic abilities, for example, for remote viewing. And what will happen, and this happened with somebody we knew, and this happened repeatedly, um, a, a reptilian being would enter her bedroom and through an interdimensional portal and, and basically enter physically, although sometimes he wasn't visible, but it, it was as if he was physically present and could be felt palpably, like on the bed would depress and she would feel him as if basically he was having sex with her right there. And then the being would activate her kundalini because the reptilians are masters at that. And then after that, the reptilian would leave and then the military would come and then take the woman and take and use her on mind controlled operations. It usually had to do with intelligence gathering and remote viewing. So that was really interesting seeing how these things happen. Um, and, and what more often than not, what we saw the love bite happen with a lot of disruptions of relationships, like disruptions of true love or relationships that could be um, helpful for the person in their healing and recovery or their awareness process. So more often than not, these Milab people in particular or abductees, uh, once they're on the awakening process, they'd be thrown a love bite relationship. And then that love bite targeted partner would be sent in on them to basically stop the process or to act as a handler in some capacity, or actually to prevent them from actually being able to explore more of their healing and awareness and sovereignty. So basically keep them in the program, basically. And sometimes these, this targeted partner who was the MyLab handler, sometimes they weren't consciously aware of how they were being used because they may still be under mind control. So there's a lot of that going on, as well as like blatant ones, like you hear in the MKUltra or the Monarch programming people. 
And then the last reason, um, the disruption of true love or even true twin flames, um, because true love is very powerful and it's very healing and it's, it is a threat to the negative agendas and beings behind those agendas because um, love will help people expand their awareness and become very powerful. And so if these beings behind these negative agendas are controlling and parasitic, they want to keep us dumbing down and compromised as much as possible. And that means taking away true love and then inserting their puppet love bite partners or false twin flames. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop here. And if there's anything that somebody else might want to add on to any of those reasons or like personal experience having to do with having been set up or somebody they know. So I'll just kind of let anybody else who wants to take the floor to chime in. I was just going to add or ask you, because you're in your book, Dark Side of Cupid, you have also a list, list of target groups, certain people that more, you know, may be targeted than others. Maybe you can share that as well. Yeah, well, the targeted thing is huge. Um, and I think I mentioned that more in the dark side of Cupid because uh, over the years we started seeing patterns. Well, like how come so many people are getting stuck in these relationships? And um, I felt there's a targeting aspect, especially, you know, women would come to me and they were somebody who was on the healing path and they had a lot of awareness. They, they were super psychic. They were able to, to do things that other people couldn't do. And I think it was because they shone so brightly and had a high quanta of life force energy and psychic ability that um, they would be targeted by interdimensional beings to be set up with like a, a love bite partner that was hosted or um, possessed by usually a reptilian being and then they would be like a they would feel like a soulmate thing and but then they realized that they were being um, disrupted and their energies were being harvested and what happens in energy vampirism one of the things that I didn't mention is that energy and awareness are linked so a lot of times when you get in a relationship with somebody who's let's say a hosted person or somebody who's possessed by one of these interdimensional beings that are acting as a vampire not only do they get you linked in and love obsessed but they they take away energy and as a result of taking away energy your awareness is also compromised so is your psychic abilities many times so what happens is confusion sets in so there's a lot of confusion when you have these relationships and it's like almost like your your critical thinking process just kind of gets shunted and you're under this spell and and the spell aspect is there's a lot of bliss that can happen when let's say they link into your energy field, let's say a specific chakra, for example, like the solar plexus or the, the root chakra or even the heart chakra, when they, when they link in, it could create kind of an activation and you could even have premature Kundalini activation as, as a result of them linking in. So that actually can be very blissful and can activate some psychic abilities. But over time, if you stay linked in with the psychic vampire that's linking in, then eventually you will lose more energy and become exhausted. And then that's when the confusion sets in and the obsession may set in because the bliss is like an, an addiction. It's like a love drug, like James Bartley has mentioned this. So um, and anyway, so some people are targeted, especially people who are bringing out information like alternative media, people who are bringing out a lot of truth about subjects that um, are meant to be kept hidden. So I think that happened in Bernard's case, actually, when you brought out those movies, those films because it didn't happen until after that. And so I think that there's a lot of people who are being actually being targeted this way by being sent in disruptors who are basically, um, they're possessed or, or mind controlled or sent in because something else is running them, like an interdimensional being is actually running these people. And so that makes them easy puppets to target people who are basically really bringing in the true awareness. And so there's a targeting phenomenon actually. So yeah. So if anybody else wants to share on that. Yeah, I mean, maybe on that note, I can just share a little bit uh, of what happened with me because it was definitely your second point of, you know, what I felt in my experience, it was definitely the emotional and sexual life force harvesting that happened. And also the confusion, you know, <laughs> element. I mean, this is, you know what, I think I, I want to also say it right at the get-go, because sometimes I get, you know, I wrote a whole blog of, about my experience and in light of the research, but sometimes people ask, well, well, how is it any different from any other relationship issues? The stuff comes up, you know, the trauma, but it's like, you know, there's a saying, you don't really understand until you have experienced it. 
you know, and this is just, you know, relationship issues exponential, like it's just times 1,000 or something. It's just insane. But, you know, the point you made, which is really the most confusing part, because it's it felt it's meant to be with all these synchronistic, like, dreams of each other and projections and, you know, and, you know, orchestrated synchronicities as well, which is important to keep in mind because a lot of the times you feel like when you experience a synchronicity, it means, oh, it's meant to be. You know, but these synchronicities can be most often orchestrated by these entity beings, you know, for their own agenda to bring two people together. And then this, you know, this obsessive character, you know, on both partners at the beginning. And then also the sexual experience can be always, in my case, so intense that it feels so beautiful and amazing and orgasmic, like Kundalini waking and everything that you're just like, oh my God, this is just meant to be. This is love on its highest level and just like, Woo, 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 you know, and I remember like of, um, you know, even three, four days being together with this woman and having the intense sexual experience. All of a sudden I got sick. Like I woke up the next day with like um, a staph infection and just fever and just like it was intense, you know, and there was no virus, no STD, nothing involved. It just, it just felt just very weak. My life was just being sucked out, you know, and it was fine, but then after I recovered a bit, you know, I felt like, okay, this is like, and I still like, we haven't really known each other, but we felt so intensely drawn to each other, you know, and there was this conflict, like part of me knew like, this is not right, this, I shouldn't be with it, like, this is not right, but I could, I was so, you know, my emotional center was just so attached to her on a sexual center, like the courts, you know, it was just like the push and pull is so extreme, you know. And then on, on her, and she then even wanted, you know, engage more in, in uh, uh, having more sex. And when I was throwing me off. So there was all this weird energy just based on this sexual feeding, which is very confusing without having established a grounding, like emotional connection and whatnot. But it was up and down, like literally looking back or looking from the outside of it made it would make no sense to anybody else. You know, everybody would say, what are you doing with her? Like, just, you know, <laughs> get out. But one day, literally in one day, I would just feel I'm totally in love with her. I just want to be with her. And just like, we had amazing times as well, blissful experiences, right? But then one trigger happened, something else, and just boom, down into, you know, a whole can of worms open up and conflict and just draining. And I felt just weak and weaker and weaker. I mean, it, even my immune system was shutting down that I got sick. And I'm, I'm a fairly healthy person. I have a healthy diet. You know, up to that point, I haven't gotten sick in over four years, you know, and then I got sick twice within that relationship in a month, you know, at the beginning. And then also towards the end, I even had to get into antibiotics because of, you know, it was just needed. But that was just, you know, that was the big what you said, that confusion, I was just, it was driving me nuts, like literally, like I didn't know what the hell was going on. And like, even if I intellectually wanted to let go, because in fact, emotionally I couldn't, it was just like, and I had so much uh, pain and just the sensation, my third chakra, you know, the solar plexus, just like my own sense of power, my will, right? Being just weakened, weakened and weakened. And, um, you know, then trying to work it out also just working on just a purely psychological level just didn't work for me. You know, I had, you know, in my own process, I also realized that acknowledged because I've taken responsibility for that experience as well, not to see myself, Oh, I'm being attacked or, you know, in this, vic in this victim position. But I realized that I was attacked through or by getting to my own blind spots, my own psychological blind spots and issues where these entities know exactly how to target, you know, my own weaknesses, you know, especially in regards to relationships or sexuality. So I had to really take a sincere look at that and really like heal that and, and, and raise my vibration on a higher level to really transcend that, that kind of attention I was getting, you know, so that kind of puts my experience in a nutshell that I, you know, others can share now maybe as well maybe maybe um actually i would like to hear uh james about this whole um obsession thing because i think he can relate to that as well very good points you raise uh bernard uh one thing that p 
people understand is the seriousness of this. I've spoken to <clears throat> a few people, a small size to be sure, but they may, it may be representative of a much wider pattern. But at times, the love bite uh, scenario, the, the feeling of being on the love drug, the excitement in the pool and the, the ebb and flow of the emotions can be so extreme that it can literally trigger very serious life-threatening conditions. Uh, one of my dearest friends is absolutely convinced that her cancer was brought, up, uh, brought about because of a particularly virulent, for lack of a better term, alien love bite scenario went through which lasted for, for a better part of two years <clears throat> with an individual clear on the other side of, of the country, uh, the planet rather. Both of these individuals were, were extremely psychic. They met on Facebook, go figure. And they also had, and this is getting deeper into the subject, I won't go too far into it because we can, we can bridge up to what I'm going to mention now. They apparently have past life connections, which, which played into this whole alien love by scenario and it, it basically for a while it ruined her relationship with her her then partner uh and it got so bad that this other guy clear across the world who was an adept in his own right i guess some would even call him a sorcerer or a warlock he began actually psychically attacking my friend's partner uh to the my, fr my friend's partner who's also a friend of mine He's quite psychic and quite gifted, too, and he could clearly see this guy in his bedroom at night basically attacking him and created this, this triangle where uh, my friend's partner was resentful towards my friend. He was feeling spite and hate towards the person that uh, my friend had become obsessed with and uh, went round and round. And the upshot was all of this, my friend is convinced, led up to the uh, onset of her cancer because her immune system was driven down so low by the emotional upheavals she'd been feeling. It must be understood by, by the viewers and listeners that it's very easy for one to get caught up in the excitement and, and the love drug feeling of the alien love, in my view, differentiates it from, from other attractions, other, other, uh, other interpersonal romantic connections. One feels as though one is floating on, on a tidal wave of emotions. And it, it feels even internally as if your indoctrinary system is causing all your glands to pump out uh, a tsunami wave of, of, of hormonal secretions that make you feel and, and ex accentuates every emotion clear across the emotional spectrum from from jealousy to to rage to to confusion and and another example where, where the uh, the health aspects kick in is, is another close friend of mine he was embroiled in, in an alien situation which he himself believes was an alien love by situation and he went from an individual in the span of just several months an individual who was physically fit, who, like Bernard, was into physical fitness, working out, uh, swimming uh, constantly. And his physical and emotional state was reduced to its lowest possible, uh, lowest possible level. And I thought at some point that he just may die because he was going through such emotional upheaval. It... <clears throat> It exacerbated all of his injuries from his past. He, he swims in order to keep his back in alignment. And all of these other issues he had with his teeth and his gums, and everything just flared up as he was going through this emotional alien love by upheavals. Uh, that, that We can talk more about that later. But as far as some of, some of the setups that, that, that Bernard talked about, a key aspect to understand is just as the ETs and these little beings can put us together, they can also, and this is two sides of the same coin, really, keep us, or some of us anyway, 
in, in a state of prolonged isolation where one is not having their emotional needs met because they find it well nigh impossible to form a lasting relationship with somebody. And we try to rationalize it sometimes, you know, well, what, what could it be? Is it nice guy syndrome? We're in, you know, because we live in this harsh patriarchal society and unfortunately many women have been programmed to uh, respond only to males who, who exude this self-confidence, this boastfulness, this, this machismo. And on the other hand, individuals, males who are, are quiet, uh, accountable, and uh, quietly self-confident and uh, not prone to boastful uh, making you know, tough macho noises, it seems even from an objective standpoint, and it can never be purely objective, but it seems that women will tend to, some women gravitate towards someone who uh, is more of a type A personality. And so some males, and I've even spoken to female abductees, who despite being quite attractive, uh, they can find themselves in periods of long isolation too due to uh, trust issues, intimacy, uh, inability to form intimacy, uh, a, a variety of issues. So in practice, what, what it can seem like is a person can meet a gal and then they seem to be getting, getting along great and then there's just a cutoff where, well, gee, what happened to her? She, things seem to be going along all right. She seemed to like me, but you know, I don't, I don't hear from her, I don't see her anymore, and so on and so forth. And when this only happens a couple of times, one could write it off as being, well, you know, I don't have that way with women, et cetera, et cetera. But if it happens over a prolonged period of time, uh, things begin to uh, pile up in, in a cumulative fashion. The feeling of loneliness, the feeling of uh, almost a feeling of, uh, disembodiment from from not only society but from oneself because we are emotional beings we are passionate beings by nature some more than others and and to be lacking in that connection uh, with someone uh, that someone special can be quite frustrating and can be quite aggravating even and so when one an individual like that is thrust into a love bite scenario it's set up to be a perfect storm because I, I see the inverse of that where when people contact uh, to get some insight into some of their experiences, I almost always, if I remember to advise them that it's not unusual for them now that they've contacted me to uh, wake up one morning and stressful towards me, suspicious towards me, even outright hostile towards me. And I tell these people that this is because the, the, these negative entities don't want to um, establish communications with me. And they will even go to the extent of manipulating the person's partner or, or family or friends. So will encourage the individual to not have anything to do with me. And finally, I tell them, they will even go to the extent of appearing to you in physical 3D, Chileans, Gray, so on and so forth, and mention you by name and say, don't have anything to do with James Bartley. They also do this to Eve Morgan. They did this to Dr. Carla Turner or Bartholi. So I'm not the only one. So the inverse of that is... Uh, you know, this, what, um, what I'm talking about, this enforced isolation. And, and so things are set up where when a targeted love bite partner comes along, and then we get caught up in the excitement of it all. And because of the pre-programming from all the Hollywood movies and all the romance novels, and so forth, we, we latch onto that, and, and we don't want to let go. And, and eventually what happens is the, the, the flood of emotions overwhelms our our reasoning capability and no longer able to to reason our way through what's going on and so this further leaves us uh right for the plucking so to speak so the imposed isolation is a key aspect of the part of the setup and then then what we have to do at that point is to recognize the the inauthentic feelings the uh, the extreme 
uh, heights of emotion. And, and like I said, it could vary because if the person going through this love bite feels they're not getting their emotional needs met, needs met by the other person, then, it, you know, the, the really insidious part of it is then it's not only just this a fusion of love and excitement and romance and whatnot, then it's, it's the opposite of that. It's feelings of, of resentment, of jealousy perish the thought the other person begins dating other people or uh, whatever the case may be. And depending on the psychological profile, as Laura said uh, earlier, because the psychological profiles are a key aspect, you can see how some people that are, are smitten with this love bite uh, syndrome can not only develop obsessive compulsive behaviors where they're just constantly consumed thoughts of the other person, murmuring their name out, out loud. Oh, Stacy, Stacy. It's, they're just walking around in, in this days. But then when the other emotions begin to kick in of, of a feeling of rejection, uh, uh, resentment, uh, jealousy, and that could boil over to rage. And in, even in the days before the internet, and, and some of the people that were afflicted, uh, in a very bad way with the alien love bite, they began acting out in ways which, which was borderline gang stalking, mm -hmm. uh, obsessively calling up the other person, yeah. obsessed driving past their home at night. Uh, things that we would associate as being stalking kind of behavior. So we just have to recognize when we're falling into these obsessive compulsive uh, states of being and mindsets, and, and recognize the traps that not, not only have been set up uh, for ourselves, but, but how we buy into those setups and how due to unmet needs, our longing, our, our, our lack of emotional fulfillment and contentment, we begin to buy into this fantasy that, that's been created for us. We begin to see that we, we create these illusions of how we can have a lifetime spent with this other person. So I, I just wanted to throw those points out and then and anyone's free to comment about that. I just wanted to, yeah, exactly. It reminds me of um, how, you know, what I call the predator versus prey setup, where usually in the love bite situation, there's always um, one that's the predator and then the prey, which is usually the more evolved out of the two. And usually in, in every one of the cases, you always see that one is, is much functioning much more under the light where they have, um, you know, they're putting, they're, they're putting their life work into what they're doing and it shows and then they get sent. It's almost like these people that are predators. They know how to spot these, these victims, like they know it and they can spot them, whether it's on a forum or whether it's um, wherever you are out. And usually these, these prey victims are very highly intelligent, psychic, evolved people. And this is the thing that's incredible to me because when this happens, the predator typically has these narcissistic traits and but the narcissism is, is there's a cover-up happening where uh, they they have this mask that they portray themselves as a victim as well so the victim actually they're mirroring the victim so there's a lot of mirroring happening in this whole uh in this whole setup that that allows you to feel like, whoa, I'm really connecting with this person. And interestingly enough, the body has somatic responses when you connect with these people, yet the insane thing is you don't react or respond to those responses, and they're usually run away. Danger, 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 and yet... Even though you're feeling this intense danger, there you are, um, compelled, L like you're in a, you're under, yeah, a spell, 
And they're mirroring specific things to you that allows you to feel this sense of familial um, that you that you've known them forever that you have so much that this person is like your family and interestingly when you diagnose these couples and you diagnose their upbringings the partner on both sides are usually very typical of a parent that they had or a handler so then it is a very interesting interplay that goes on because it, the, it's the, I also call it the heaven and the hell um, response because within the predator, there's always two personalities and one is very heavenly, very good, very wonderful. And then of course they have the personality that is the narcissistic rage, the person who hides and reacts with the feelings, the traits that are all meant to keep you in this little cage. Yet you're addicted, but you've been groomed to be an addict. You've been groomed to be an addict of love. And addiction to love is a part of how we've been set up in our family upbringings because we haven't been shown what's healthy either. So not knowing what's healthy just allows us to walk right into the snare, regardless of our somatic responses screaming at us to run away. Yeah. Basically, that which we haven't received as children, we try to seek outside of ourselves, which is the most basic set right. of frustrated <laughs> relationships. And, and then the predator, for some reason, can mirror exactly what it is that you want. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and it's almost like mirroring they're mirroring who you are because see you're always the more evolved so you're gonna in essence be falling in love with that mirror image yeah. what do you but also what ties in are they? with mention of prey the higher evolved so to speak the more sensitive yeah. one also ties into empaths mm -hmm. empaths and codependents because they've been groomed to be codependents and they're always empathic but so is the so is the predator the predator is also empathic See, this is what makes this very complex. Right. Because you've got two psychic people, but they're both operating with different programs. And one is really great at mirroring. It's all, but, but you have to ask yourself, when you remove the mirror, when you start coming out of the spell, when, when you remove the mirror, what do you have inside that predator, inside the, who's, who's in there? Is there a personality? Is there, or did they just mirror what, what they knew that you wanted? Did they just mirror what they knew you, you are? Well, that you could even tie that into the idea of quote unquote organic portals, spiritless humans. I know Tom wrote about that, that these puppet people, you know, who cannot activate the higher centers mirror our soul potential and what we, what we see in them is actually us in a sense. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and that in itself creates. I mean, wow! If you want to, if you want to talk about utilizing people as portals, oh yeah, I mean, how many portals do they create mm -hmm. in these yeah. scenarios? That's it's. it's yeah, limited. that's that's probably the big thing that was figured out in well the dark side of Cupid. That more often than not, there was there was an interdimensional being running the targeted partner who had the more narcissistic predator characteristics and they were being used to basically control and, and disrupt the other person until the other person woke up. But like you said, I think many people who've, at least those who've had, let's say alien abduction histories or my lab or MK ultra, or who had, let's say narcissistic parents who are abusive, they're, they're raised uh, in ways where they never really knew love or they may have shut down their feelings so that they're more vulnerable. But even with the, the abduction, the my lab thing, they actually set your life up so that you don't get your needs met and so that you're really hurting. And so then, then they bring you this carrot that's like the perfect lover. And of course you want to fall for it because you're so hungry. And so they create that and it's like out of the frying pan into the fire. That's one of the programming things that they say in some of these Illuminati bloodlines, they they do this on purpose. Like once you get out, then they've got something waiting for you. That's already part of their tiered um, gauntlet of, of control system. So 
I've seen it that way. It's just that there's an interdimensional level that's playing this game and using people basically as portals until those people do their healing work and get rid of all that and start operating from their true core essence. And, and so the whole healing thing is so important, but we can only do our own healing. Obviously we can't do it for somebody else. Yeah. And interestingly, usually the predator, I mean, from what I found is they're usually possessed they're yep. usually inhabiting mm -hmm. something else that's driving them. And, and the traits connected to the predator are specific, very, very specific in terms of the destructive quality that they have and that they operate under. And, and, I, and I, oftentimes it doesn't even mean that they, they're conscious of it. No. They're being run. They're being literally run themselves, and they're a victim themselves. I think that's important to keep in mind what yeah. I said to learn, to not make it personal. No, because no. Then these entities feed off of that conflict and that friction when you get make it in this interpersonal ego, right. you know, battle, whatever. But then they are just put for something else. And I've also learned when I would try to work it out, like, and my partner wasn't aware of it, like, it just makes things worse. You know what I mean? Well, you got to really... <laughs> because that's what I call inverted reality. Yeah. Okay? Because... The dynamic is always going to be that, that reality becomes inverted and twisted because you've, got, you've always got one person who's functioning with personality disorders or, or emotional dysregulation under development so that they twist reality around, but they have enough credence in it so that it, it appears like it could be right, but, we, but you know it's not. It's like trying to work out a relationship right. with the borderline. You kind of get in and then, you know, something shifts, but then it's going to be turned around on you again. Yeah, and then you're lost in it. And before you yeah. know it, you're not sure which way is up. Yeah. It's a very, yeah, it's a very, very confused. And then you start self-doubting, but that's because they're so good at manipulation of reality. And I think that just calls to question how important it is for us to really stand in our core truth in our heart and to really know who we are so that when this these predator um deceivers because some of them are really really good at what they do i mean they're i think some of them are hosted by some of the most intelligent deceitful beings imaginable and so to be able to really perceive that clearly um takes a lot of resolve and a lot of healing and a lot of um you know getting your needs met so you don't, you're not vulnerable because these beings are really, really good at what they do. I mean, they can get the best of us. And that's the thing. We're not really, this is not really happening to us because we have a problem because we're um, victims who haven't worked on our stuff. The truth is some of us really are targeted and we have been working on our stuff and we we're targeted by these really high level sorcerer host types. And we only discover it later after talking to other people and sharing like this, this is something, this is real. So I also think there's some some predators or that they appear predator like who are actually the real deal. Like, let's say two real soul sparks are meant to be together. I don't like using twin flame anymore because it's just leaves a bad taste. But let's say let's just say there are really two twin soul sparks that are meant to be together, you know, like Tom and Carissa, let's say. And um and you know that they're really good together, but they have been imprinted and overlaid to respond and react like they are love bites. So both are my lab, both have been overlaid and imprinted so that they're, they're functioning under the program due to how they've been manipulated. So then that begs to question, okay, so how do you distinguish between what's, what's a real couple who've been my lab, who are actually two real soul sparks that are meant to be together. And how do you find out the ones that are the imposters? Well, uh, you know, in, in this sense, I would like to, to share my experience. Uh, the big problem is that uh, when these thing, kind of things happen, you know, you start having all these synchronicities and experience and all that. Most people, uh, I did it myself, we go online and we try to find answers there. And basically online, what you're going to find is a new age explanation of what's going on to you. So many, many ladies, they told me, well, I, I was starting to have the synchronicities, the dreams. I met this person. I felt this, this, and that. I went online. And what did I find? The twin flame. So uh, when I spoke, for example, to these friends uh, and told them, well, what if that guy uh, they think is a twin flame? Maybe he's not. Maybe um, 
his uh, something else. Maybe he was not positive to your life. They could not even listen to me. They said that all this uh, psychic stuff and all the feelings and all that was happening to them, they were told in dreams it had to be. It had to be the twin point. And when I told them if the guy is not good enough for them or maybe the person is not even interested in them and that they should try to date someone else, what they say is that the, they will be cheating on their twin flame and they will not be able to do that to their twin flame because they're sure that it's him. And that became a, a very big uh, psychological mess and obsession thanks to what they read in the New Age teachings. And... Uh, one thing I saw is that all this time I have seen that uh, there's a big link between the alien UFO phenomenon and uh, the way the New Age is teaching things online and the agenda. And apparently this is nothing new. Uh, apparently this is even an ancestral thing. And these beings uh, are even mentioned in biblical texts. So uh, this makes it even more deceptive and difficult to deprogram because we're considering the fact that it involves spirituality beliefs and feelings of love and passion that can be very, very addictive. So you add to that, uh, as Laura said, the personal traumas and the, the, the wounds to heal, and that makes it even more and more difficult to deprogram. So I think it's, it's very important to, to address this because you go online and you get flooded by the, by the other teachings of the Twin Flames, but not many people are talking about this. And uh, especially women, they're they are really falling for this uh, Twin Flames program. And in most cases, I, I don't say maybe 100%, but maybe 90% of cases is a masquerade of the island of bite. You, you say anything about like uh, cult leaders and cults, how people can get sucked into that, maybe because they want some understanding about a Twin Flame thing and they get sucked into certain cult leader teachings that may promote that and then they find themselves getting sucked into something that's part of a program. Because um, I know that's an experience with several people here where they've observed um, channeling and then cult groups and how they actually helped feed these interdimensional beings that are actually the predators. So I don't know if that's a topic we can kind of launch into. Yeah, but uh, before we get to that point, I think I want to reflect a little bit on what's been said so far. Um, I mean, one of the big takeaways that you can, you know, get from all this is that all these manipulations, they have to override your intuition. You know, they have to override your, your the, the genuine connection that you might have or not have with someone. So, you know, if you're, like Laura was talking about these warning signs, whether they're synchronistic. In my case, I've had dream warnings about people long, long ago. Uh, dream warnings, synchronicities, so intuition. Uh, and even just like logical signs, like if the person is acting in a psychopathic or sociopathic way, I mean, there are like actual symptoms behind that. And but the, but the thing is, all these things can be overridden if they can pump you with enough programming. You know, this this is mind control trance thing that they have going on, and uh, and of course that hormonal surge, which can be uh, can be induced either telepathically, hypnotically, uh, technologically, you know, chemically. All these avenues are available for them to override what is the, the actual genuine signal within us. So one of the things that they can do is uh, bring together people that might not necessarily have even a genuine connection. So we have, I mean, we have different aspects of it. We have the one aspect where you don't have a genuine connection, but they use a hormonal surge to make you just 100% hyper extreme puppy love in love with this person, right? Or uh, they can just use simple mind programming where you feel like you're in a trance and like, I don't know why I'm going along with this, but you know, I'm just going to go along with it because and you just kind of slide into that because the end result is the same. Either one will result in you being hooked up to this person, which then accomplishes whatever agenda needs to be accomplished, whether it's energy draining, whether it's trying to suffocate your spirit through just the negative influence of this person, the mind games that they play. And uh, another thing I should mention is, you know, these psychosomatic symptoms, Sometimes, you know, it's just, it's just due to us undergoing these intense emotions, which, you know, disrupt our, our, our subtle uh, body energy mechanisms. But other times, it might also be due to uh, energy contamination by the dark entities that are working through uh, this other person who's acting as, as a portal for these, for these entities. And um, it's been reported that um, greys, demons, reptilians, that they have an energy field that is very dark compared to yours. It's, it's not compatible. So if you take that, that energy and you inject it into yourself, you're going to get sick, you know, and uh, sexual interaction is one of the, the most 
potent forms of energy transfer between two people that's possible, which is another reason why, why they would use that avenue, you know, if they're, if they're trying to get at you. So, you know, th these are uh, many of the things that, uh, that we have to watch for. And, you know, Bernhard, you were talking, you brought up the idea of portals, uh, spiritless humans, as I call them. And I've been trying to track, like, what kind of person is it that is so easily manipulated and moved into surrounding someone or hooking up with them or targeting them in order to bring them down? And generally what I found is these people tend to be uh, extremely emotionally fractured. So it's almost like you take a soul and you kind of break it apart. And you have these voids in there, and these voids then act as portals through which these influences then can work. You know, um, other times these people tend to be not too self-aware. So therefore, if you're not self-aware, then you can't self-correct yourself. And so, if you have a whole lifetime of manipulation and contact, and these entities working through a person, that person by the time they're you know who knows what 20, 30 years old, I mean, they're going to be pretty much like marionettes on a string, just because they have had. They've been groomed for such a long period of time. Um, yeah, so that's one of the general patterns that I've seen is these people who are somewhat empty and fractured, you know, uh, traumatized. So they're prime portals within our population which can be moved at will by these forces to target any, anyone whom they really wish to target. I mean, and on that note, I wanted to add that I have um, an experience in my own life that, I mean, it's exactly what all of you guys have just been talking about. Um, it's somebody I mentioned in my book, Chasing Phantoms. It was an ex-boyfriend from years ago in the 90s named Steve. So if anyone's read my book, they'll probably know what I'm talking about. But um, this was a guy who, as a kid, it only I only realized this after we'd broken up. It seems very apparent he had been molested. Um, his dad was NSA. Um, so there's the military industrial complex connection going on there. It's very important to mention. Um, and, and they actually had lived for a period of time in Rockville, Maryland, which is the NSA headquarters. And they had the thems that would always come around and um, check in with the neighbors to make sure the dad wasn't spilling military secrets because he worked in nuclear engineering. And um, so that's his background. And it seemed like he'd been molested um, I think from more than one source. So he was severely fractured. He was already addicted to drugs by the time he was nine, was rehabbed and done and over with it by the time he's 16. Very traumatized, very fractured, um, empty, like what you guys were describing. So I, I just give this backstory just to explain. So then we, <laughs> I ended up being roommates with him and a bunch of other people. We were, so we're all living under the same roof together. And, you know, he was like a very attractive guy, but I had no feelings for him ever in that way because I always knew there's something really wrong and off about this guy. So that ties into what you guys have been talking about, overriding your intuition. I mean, I was young. I was 21, so I'm kind of, you know, stupid in a lot of ways, but but aware in a lot of others. So I could tell there's something really off about this guy. So yeah, he's attractive, but not in that way. I don't want to be with him. Um, but you know, long story short, circumstances ended up happening where, um, and this is going to tie into, I know a subject that we all have on our bullet point list. We're going to get more into detail later. Um, but false reality creation where I did this stupid thing because I was single and I had I wanted to like intend to have a boyfriend so <laughs> I got my can this candle I had which happened to be black and I know I'm, I told E.V. And, and Laura this story before so you guys are familiar with it but I, stupid me I get a black candle and I'm just like okay, I'm going to intend, I'm going to, I want a boyfriend. I'm ready for a relationship. Yeah, I want to find somebody. And I did this thing where I'm like intending, intending, intending with this candle for like a half an hour. So it's basically, and I had no idea what I was doing. It's like just naive and stupid. I didn't realize anything back then. And the very next day, my car was totaled in an accident, just total, very bad car accident. Because of that car accident, I no longer had transportation to get to my job. So now I'm stranded in the house all the time. Um, and long story short, that's where we start now spending time together every single day where I would have normally been out and about. I would have been at my job or I would have been off doing things. So now we're together every single day. And wouldn't you know, within three months we were together. We kind of fell into a situation, but it was because he kind of was working it and working it and working it and working it for three months and kind of just, it wore me down. So this ties into what Tom was just describing of where 
you just almost feel hypnotized. Like you're just kind of going along with something that you wouldn't normally and you're overriding intuition. So I just fell into this situation, but it felt like a hypnotic thing. It's, it's not real. It's not a real attraction at all. It's not normal. And, you know, even when we were roommates, one of the big things that this guy seemed, he just had this agenda about wanting to convert me to an atheist be an atheist like him. So he was hardcore atheist, anti-spiritual, used to always say the same script that, you know, we're all just pieces of meat and that one day it's lights out and that's the end. And it was this like script he always had. So, and he would try to get me into arguments when we were roommates to try to convert me to atheism. And, you know, then I now I'm dating him. And so that just really continued. And um, he, he kind of eventually kind of worked me enough to convince me to try to be atheist and just see the, the world through this very anti-spiritual um, lens. And, you know, and I do take responsibility for all this. I'm not like trying to like, oh, I'm a victim and he made me do all these things. I mean, you no, know, we do have responsibility. Um, I overrode my intuition. I knew better. And yet I continued with this anyway. And the reason being is because I was alone in life, very vulnerable. My family's out of the picture due to severe abuse. I mean, I have no relationship with my parents. Um, and I'm alone and vulnerable and lonely. I didn't have a boyfriend. And so there's all these factors that, you know, made me susceptible um and why i kind of went along with things when i probably shouldn't have and so yeah i ended up becoming an atheist and trying to turn my back and um, having a spiritual view of reality and it was just in retrospect it was like he was like being a handler it was like he was there to try to handle me and keep me down and, and the thing that defined him it was very empty um i used to call him like i nicknamed him a robot back when we were just roommates because he just seemed so emotionally cold and detached and just weird and there's just something off about him so he's just like this fractured empty soul who things were working through he probably also had mind control programming through the nsa connections god knows what was done to him as a kid because that's the whole thing about the my labs thing is oftentimes targets of my labs you have parents that are in the military and things that are being done to them they also do it to the offspring and it's just this you know, all, all the way down the line. It's a genetic thing. So God knows what was done to him. And um, I mean, it, and then it was just like, as the relationship were on over about three plus years, I slowly started to wake up, which I think didn't you, you kind of mentioned mm -hmm. before when you were talking. Yeah, you should, some, yes, somebody did. And um, you just start to wake up. It's like coming out of this daze. And I remember I was rereading my old journals from that time period where I'm, I'm documenting the ups and downs of our turbulent relationship because he was like a Jekyll and Hyde personality where he was hot and then cold, hot, cold, flip-flop. And the thing about him also was that his personality, he was like the exact combination of both my parents. He had all the coloring and all the physical features of my dad and the Jekyll and Hyde personality of my mother. And the, the controlling, um, bossy, authoritarian kind of personality also of my dad. So it was just like if you combine both my parents together, you know, that's who he was. And I pulled that into my reality. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I was rereading my, my journal where I'm like, you can see as I'm waking up to, you know, this turbulent relationship where it's just up, down, up, down. And I'm, and I was like, I'm rooting myself on, like when I was reading it, like I was reading somebody else's story, like you go girl. And I was seeing how I was waking up and questioning his mind games. He's always just trying to keep me down. Um, and then I just kind of woke up and eventually we broke up because I brought my brother out to California, which is a whole other story, trying to help him and fix him and whatever. So I broke up with Steve and that's where I moved in with my brother as a roommate. We got a two bedroom apartment and I was going to help take care of him and get him back on track in life. And so we had broken up. And then, um, the epilogue of the story is like, after we broke up, I had to go back to the apartment, like that we used to live in together about three weeks after we broke up, I was just getting a couple of things I had left behind. And when he opened the door, it was like, I was looking at a stranger, like it, and when I've told you guys the story before, the only way I can describe how I felt, it was almost like embarrassment. Like I was embarrassed. Like how did I spend five years of my life with this guy? It was a year and a half as roommates and then three plus years as, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend. And I look at him now after only three weeks of being apart and I feel like I don't even know him. It's like, I, like I woke up out of a daze and I just had no idea why was I with this guy? Like, who is he? Like, what, what is the, it was just, I was just like embarrassed. It's almost this weird, embarrassing 
shameful feeling that, you know, you had spent years with someone that you don't even know under, under a spell, you know, and so I tell the story, I don't mean, it's no, no disrespect to Tom who I'm with now, because I was already over this guy before we even broke up. So, and then I actually spent years beating myself up over it, um, about why I was ever with him, how I allowed myself to get pulled into that situation. But I understand, I mean, the, the vulnerabilities I was facing at the time in my youth where I'm alone and isolated. And, you know, he's four years older than me and he was, um, kind of t very take charge personality. And it's just kind of swoop in and just, you know, took charge of that. And so I understand now how it happened. So I don't beat myself up over it anymore, but I just wanted to put that story in there because it encompasses every, all the things you guys have just been talking about. So that was like a really good example to illustrate. Can you describe um, his behaviors for people? Yeah, well, it was, um, like I said, very cold and emotionally detached, disconnected, kind of empty, which is why I called him like a robot. Um, Jekyll and Hyde personality flip-flopping, so he's hot one moment, and then he just all of a sudden will just switch. Yeah, which ties into the multiple personality disorder. There was an instance where we were talking, you know, he said something, I said something, he said something, I said something, and all of a sudden he just switched in the middle of the conversation. Like, from one sentence to the next, it was like he kind of like came to and he had no idea what we were even talking about. And he denied the entire conversation we'd just been having. And he wasn't trying to mess with me. He really had no, he had like no idea what we were talking about. And, you know, so there was this, he also had blackout periods where he just didn't remember entire chunks of things he had done. You know, even when, as roommates, all of us together, like as far as he was concerned, a lot of things never happened. He just wasn't there. So there was the blackout periods, the, the persona switching in mid-conversation, something my brother also witnessed of him when my brother moved in with us before we moved on to get our own place together. Um, the hot, cold, Jekyll and Hyde. Um, very controlling and just seemed to operate with an agenda to try to, in this, in my case, it was to cut me off from all things spiritual, metaphysical, which I was involved with before I was with him. I was the person who always had the tarot cards and, you know, believed in psychic abilities. And I always had all my experiences with that. And, um, I was just in tune with that sort of thing and interested in it, researched it since I was a kid. And, um, something my family discussed and then along comes him and it's just like trying to stamp that out and, and get me to stop with that and just be empty which is why after we broke up like I, I talk about this in my book his only big complaint about me that he could come up with and it was said with such disgust and disdain was that and you were never really an atheist like he was just like how dare you like you She's pretended to be an atheist to me, and I can tell that you're not really. This is like this huge indiscretion on my part. Like, of all the things that I guess, not that I did anything, it's not like I cheated on him or did anything, but that was his biggest complaint that he could come up with. So, showing that there was almost like an agenda, that was the number one thing, was to just get me to be an atheist and, you know, be anti-spiritual at all costs. And it just infuriated him that apparently it was the mission had failed, you <laughs> know. I think that, you, you know, that basically ties into what I experienced as well, or many of us who are targeted. It's not just, you know, there's the psychic, emotional, sexual feeding or the luge they feed off of the friction and the conflict, but also to um, push us uh, off our path, off of our path, you know, to kind of, you know, destroy us or what we're meant to do or be or whoever, right? So I can definitely relate this in my uh, um experience as well, especially, especially after the relationship, if it was already over, but still the courts connected and I was dealing with some public attacks, it just put me in a downward spiral and all the shame and guilt came up of even like, I even had suicidal thoughts, which I never, never really suicidal tendencies, but just visions of like holding a gun against my head or hanging myself and just even wanting to delete my blogs and films. It was just all part of like this whole mechanism and, you know, I feel literally like something in my third chakra, the sense of my will self power. Right. And, you know, which ties in again, what Tom mentioned, which is really, really important. What I realized too, was about intuition. Right. And, uh, because looking back at my experience, I can totally relate to what Carissa says. Uh, I was rereading my blog that they wish I had my experience and almost like a past life. It was like, Holy shit. I can't believe like I'm, I've healed myself. I feel so good and learned my lesson. These are just also, I feel like initiations in the sense, right. To help us, if we work through it, it makes us stronger. Right. But, you know, looking back, the red flags were always there. 
I was just not uh, acknowledging them because I wasn't trusting myself. You know, the lack of healthy self-love and, you know, and then I, I remember Eve, Eve you, were, um, you were writing in your book, Dark Side of Cupid, also about red flags, right? And why people don't listen to the red flags or their intuition that ties into our own childhood, wondering how we've been diminished, put down in our whole society and schooling doesn't nurture that part of ourselves, you know? And I will say that, like you said, Bernard, that um, it's a learning lesson. You, you, there's always something positive to be gleaned from anything negative that happens to us for the most part. And in this case, because I was with such a terrible guy, it taught me a lot of lessons. I, it made me become aware of the fact that I was attracting in things that I was familiar with. I mean, being abused you know, by your parents physically or verbally and emotionally, it's no fun, but it becomes all you know. And right. it programs your subconscious. That's all you know. You don't like it, but it's all you know. And then next thing you know, you're attracting in people in your life that are just, it's the same energy. And, and until you become aware that that's in your field and that that's happening, you, there's no way to break out of it. And you'll just keep attracting those people. So I, he made me aware that, I mean, look at him. He's the exact conglomerate of both my parents put into one person. And I attracted that in. So I had to become aware of that. And then being with such a terrible guy made me, then have a basis of comparison and realize I want somebody good, which I, which helped pave the way for why I'm with somebody like Tom, who's a, a good guy. He doesn't, there's, he, there's nothing about him that's like my ex. So, you know, it's just it, good things did kind of come out of it in a weird way. So hey, John, you can, we can only connect the dots looking back not in the midst of it. It's all fucking confusing, obviously. And like, <laughs> yeah. one thing I, I wondered about was, and maybe, maybe everybody can um, also share their perspective on this. The one thing that um, I, would, would disturb me was trying to figure out which one is the real identity? Is it the one that, um, is it the, the nice one or is it the, the bad one? Or neither. What do you mean real identity? Well, the real, yeah, because when you get a victim, let's just say the predator is a victim as well, right? Because everybody's a victim in this game, right? But uh, when I say what is the real identity, it's like, who's the real personality? Who's, how do you know who the real personality is? I mean, when you went out with him, Carissa, and you said he was, a, um, he was like a Jekyll and a Hyde, so he would have like, he would just become the aggressor, right? Right, right, right. You know, just, he could have this just super pleasant and, you know, just have that persona where, you know, he looks nice, he's really well, and, and he's very pleasant, but only behind closed doors did I see that other side where he would just get cold and he could just say some things. And he had a lot of anger that he would like buried, like rage deep down. So he could lose it and like, you know, flip a table and come after you and chase you through the apartment. And he's going to come, that happened on way. So the relationship started bordering on abusive by the end. I mean, it was getting really messed up. And that's why when I was rereading my journal, I was like, oh my God, like I tell you I was reading somebody else's life. And I'm like rooting for them to finally wake up and leave this terrible person, you know? So that, that Jekyll and Hyde thing, it was only behind closed doors. When he was with the rest of the world, he was as pleasant as could be, you know? And everybody thought he was the greatest guy, you know? They didn't see that he had problems. He's very, very good at hiding it. But good, by the way, that's a very good point too. From the outside, people don't actually see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's a description of a narcissist, 100%. And uh, what we can see here is that apparently uh, becoming a narcissist or developing this kind of uh, features in a person is very much connected to entity possession. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I have seen, for example, I saw it in, in, my, in my ex as well that uh, he had very uh, much uh, unhealed issues. He had a lot of anger that he didn't resolve but he could be very nice very kind very gentle but he started changing over time and then he started becoming aggressive and uh, to a, to, a, to a point that it was almost unbearable he was even uh, physically violent and that's not the way he was raised by his family there was nobody else in the family who was like that so i i really suspected that in some way something happened in the way some kind of entity maybe uh, got uh, as well inside of him and tried to, to, uh, to make him change, and he really became a narcissist.
Yeah. Yeah, Over- in my ex's case, I really believe the severe drug use he did when he was a kid opened him up to demonic stuff on top of whatever military my lab's programming I'm guessing he went through. I mean, you know, being NSA and all that. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And and it was like, it just kind of got worse and worse over time. Like you were just saying, Arella, it's like, he it, it didn't start out like that. And then it was just, just becoming downright abuse. Some of the things that would come out of this guy's mouth towards me, like by the end, it was just, and then I started wising up and it got to the point where one time we were having, he, he would do a lot of mind games, like just really try to keep me down. And my brother saw it right away when he came to live with us. So he said, oh, he's threatened by you, you know, you know, he, he knows you're smarter than him and, you know, it threatens him, but um, he would just start pulling his usual mind games because he's so used to me taking it, but now I was like waking up and wising up to things. And I remember one time he was pulling his games and I just said, you know, fuck you, and just walked away and left him standing there literally talking to a wall. So, <laughs> and, and just, I started doing that and kind of, you know, coming out of it, so... But the fatal attraction dance of this whole interplay is something that is fascinating to me uh, in certain points, in certain ways, because there's always a push pull with their behaviors and, and, you know, where it leads into what James said, what about the obsessive compulsive um, needs that, but also an engulfment and just like this power play, constant power play. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but, and but, an energy vampire too. I forgot to mention that. Like I would literally have my energy drained every time I was in his presence. I didn't know about energy vampirism back then. I wasn't well versed in it, but it was a phenomenon. I'd come home from work, we'd sit around and we'd be talking about our days and literally within a half hour, it was like all my energy was getting siphoned into him and he would go from being kind of slumped to being full of pep and energy and I would literally go and crawl onto the bed and go take a nap. I was exhausted like you just feel like it's like a life force it's a different it's not a normal type of tired it's life force energy and this was confirmed by our friend Mike we had, we had a mutual friend Mike who anytime they had to work on cars together and they'd both be on you know those little roller boards underneath the cars passing wrenches back and forth you know doing that thing Mike said he hated working with this guy on cars even though they're friends because he would just be exhausted after being around him so he, he was an energy vampire anyone he was around he would just suck their life force so that was another thing I forgot to mention it was very important it was another huge red flag so, and what about the dynamic where um somehow everything gets twisted so that you're blamed for everything essentially oh, of course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, they, and that's typical narcissism so mm-hmm. no matter you can't win like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't mm-hmm. because even if they are the ones that cause an issue or they're the ones that create the drama, which typically is the way it goes, you will be blamed yeah. somehow or other. They're the victim. Yeah, and they shame and blame too. And they shame, blame, yeah, project, <laughs> shame, blame, project, and then punish. Oh, yeah. yeah. Punitive, punitive. Why don't you talk about that, Evie? Yeah, well, I mean, I was just thinking of something that happens actually with several people where they feel like they were victimized and I, there's always a part of how we allow ourselves to be victimized through our own not listening to the red flags for example but a lot of times even if you confront let's say a narcissist or somebody who's being manipulative and overstepping their boundaries um and then you're saying hey you know i think you're being manipulative i don't really like what you did and then they turn around and blame you and make you wrong and then they shame you well all you had to do was ask we well, should just said no and then, but they're still acting on deception and acting on invasive boundaries and, and justify being manipulators and controllers and abusers. And then they make you wrong if you complain about it because you didn't stand up. But then they created the situation in the first place. I think so that actually, that's a reptilian tactic and that's a narcissist tactic. A, a or if you criticize them. If you are at all critical and you bring up a fault that they have, they just lose it yeah. I, learned, I learned that the hard way too but the problem is is that we don't sometimes because we sometimes assume that others just feel and think like we do we can rationally or with reason talk about this right so yeah, that's the yeah. ties to the assumption of people have in the new age as well that we are all one I, that oh. means we're all the same and you know and like yeah. and all but that. that's interesting bernard because i and I want to hear more uh, from Aurelia, but that's exactly interesting because the one thing that is just maddening is that when you try and rationally explain a situation or uh, some drama that occurred, when you try to be rational about it, you can't. It's 
it's like you can't communicate with them the way that you would be able to communicate with anybody else. Yeah. It's all... It throws them off even more. You yeah. know what I mean? I think Carissa was talking about it makes it even more confused. They have blackouts. They don't even remember. Like when you bring sense in the situation, it's like they're short cutting. You know what I mean? Like it's just malfunctioning because they can't receive that. But they can't communicate it. And that's one of the things I learned where, um, you know, I went to therapy and did a lot of schooling to get my degree and everything. And one of them is com communication skills and learning how to communicate to uh, do problem solving or conflict resolution or compassionate communication. But with people who don't quote play by the rules because they're by nature psychopaths or narcissists or they're hosted or run by something, they can't play by the rules because they never play fair. So they always twist and, and turn things. So it's really hard actually to communicate clearly with someone like that unless you have absolute evidence and you're doing it in front of a third party and then they might back down because they don't ever want to be exposed for what they are and what they're doing because there's something inside them that actually really knows it's not always running you know and i don't think they can always tap into their core emotion either i think that's part of the the symptomology of their design is that there's so much trauma there that they have, they have to have all these masks. Mm -hmm. and they have to protect themselves at all costs. Therefore, it's essential for them that they, you know, spin it and twist everything so that they can never get inside. Because that would be, they just can't do it. Yeah. It's all. It's almost like it, it's an unbearable pain for them or something. Like they can't mm -hmm. have that level of realization or or connection with themselves which it, it makes me think again of what Chris has said that feeling that they have that they're empty oh yeah right and that's the thing is he actually would um there's been times where he had apologized for something so he wasn't quite like what you're just describing right now however when he did it was empty it was like he didn't really feel like he actually really cared about the damage he'd inflicted or the terrible things that come out of his mouth or it was just more like He's reading, he could tell I'm upset, and if he wants to be able to cohabitate in peace, he better do something just to make it right, but he doesn't care. It doesn't bother him that I had, you know, that he said something really terrible or, you know, was being raged at him. And that's the distinction right there, because I think when you have a person who's genuinely tormented and tortured and fractured, let's say, and, and being run by something within them, if they're genuinely sorry, and if you see that they're genuinely sorry, and they just can't control certain reactions that occur or certain puppeteering, then I think that's a way to see that there is a distinction between that and a real predator. Oh, yeah. He was just empty. I mean, by the end of the relationship, he'd had this new tactic where I, he was started to talk to me all the time like I was five years old and really stupid, like just a really dumb five-year-old, like a father talking to a little kid. And I was like, where is this coming from? And his eyes would just be empty while he was doing it. The same way his eyes were empty when he'd be reciting these scripts all the time. Like, he's just like an empty vessel that was just filled with whatever stuff wanted to fill him with. And whether it was scripts or you know, okay, now you got to treat her like this or try this tactic, you know, and it's treat her like she's a stupid oh. five-year-old. And then by that point, then the relationship was over. I, that was the end of that. But I, it was just interesting to look back at that with everything I know now and see it with the new eyes, you know, where at the time I was like, what is this? <laughs> like, what is happening? So, and, and, you know, I do, I realize he is a victim in this. So, you know, I saw pictures of him as a little boy and, and like everybody, he was a cute and innocent little boy. And I think terrible things were done to him that nobody deserves and he was severely fractured and i think it's like his soul just exited stage left it couldn't handle it anymore and he was taken over by stuff and so you know he's a victim in it too and that's a healing like uh, yeah it would be great if we could focus on healing on both sides like not just because they're victims as well yeah. so it, it's there's hope for everybody i don't believe anybody's fully ever lost it's just how much they're willing to work yeah and they do have to be willing i mean yeah many factors like um i know that with the severe abuse a lot of times with the fracturing and let's say if they're in one of those families right that they're already what i call their underborn rights they're under somebody who's um, nsa aerospace military industrial complex or illuminati bloodline and these kinds of groups are actually, their bloodlines are already under the born rights of many interdimensional beings that are already running them. So they have like an extra hurdle to go 
through actually is to to come out from under that as well as the 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 abuse and just the healing from the abuse itself that they've got the extra interdimensional interference as well as mind control programming then all those different things are interplaying which can make healing a really complicated process if they don't even know quote what the problem is and i think that's why so many people don't heal is because they don't even get to the higher levels of what's really running them and so it's like the human part of you has to shine so brightly and to want so bad to heal that you can you can do it. But if you don't want it bad enough and you can't get through that level, it, it's not likely to happen or happen. It'll take a really, really long time, many lifetimes, you know. That, all, that also ties into uh, how a lot of people, especially in this day and age, go into like spirituality, fringe topics and new age and yada, yada, but don't have like just the basic foundational uh, knowledge and application of basic psychological self-work, you know, just basic shadow, understand shadow projection, basic sh uh, childhood wounding, all the stuff, how we, you know, s sometimes attract a part of that is a shadow aspect of our parent, you know, and seek love outside ourselves and yada, yada, like these, the like basic things of psychology, which is, which are very much needed to help to turn off the food source, so to speak, right? Absolutely. I think the new age is, is becoming a real problem because, I mean, I know there's a lot of healers out there who claim a lot of things, and, but they don't have in-depth psychotherapeutic or trauma resolution understanding. And so they'll try this, this method or that method and think this Reiki will work or this. And, and it's like it doesn't work because they don't have the thorough understanding of even how these things work. And then they're being used by, their, let's say, their spirit guides for actually guiding the whole thing so that they can be resources for these loose predators. Mm -hmm. So, And this is why, like what Arella said, you know, these women are looking for help and then they, then they fall into these twin flame forums where it's basically encouraging this wonderful connection and then really it's like one of these dark side of cupid things so it's people don't even know what's happening and they don't even know how to heal so that this doesn't happen and there's just yeah. a lot of false beliefs just trapping them into being predated upon you know yeah exactly actually i see a lot of people that uh, they prefer to go to new age healers and many of these people they don't even have a degree or have not even studied psychology or have a, a little bit of uh, let's say background or information about how to do things they just basically do the reiki or the other techniques and it's just passing by entities from one person to another and from one person to another it's it's like uh, going to to a hospital and getting the flu and all the virus you know when you go to these healers because they they really don't know what they're doing they are giving you meditations and things to do and let's invoke this deity and let's call for this angel and let, let's connect to this and uh, they are just making people become parasited instead of healing. So normally to all the ladies that uh, contact me, I say, you have to find a good psychologist, but a clinical who won't get maybe too much in the spiritual. The spiritual, maybe you can do it yourself because we cannot get into the belief of people and say, well, you have to believe this or you have to do this prayer. That's very personal and they have to get to that through their own. But you have to do the psychological work in a clinical way without people doing Reiki or telling you to connect to Kuan Yin or to whatever, just basically clinical healing. Thank I you. Agree. I mean, it's, I agree. But you know what I found out is both ways because in my own process with one of these um, um, love bite experience in my life, with my, uh, my ex-girlfriend many years ago, we went actually to psychotherapy together, which helped a lot. Gestalt therapy, basic young in psychology and just tracing it back to childhood wounding, I can see how she reflected my mother on some level. And it was very insightful, very good, you know, so it really helped me on, on a certain level. But then I also got stuck on this level because then, I, you know, I knew there was something else operating and I tried to uh, interpret and see everything through the psychological lens, you know, and not understanding, okay, there's other entities or something else and then got hung up, hung up on the labeling as well. You know what I mean? Like, borderline personality, narcissist, which are all valid labels which we need to understand certain things. But in the end, these are, you know, people who are borderline personality, narcissists, whatever, are like we just established in the end, these are entities working through them or being possessed by them. And we just, you know, label that as from a psychological perspective, right? But I found there's a trap as well. It's got both ways. Like uh, Ariel said, it's very important and I agree have a foundational, clear, just psychological understanding, application, healing, you know, but also not be limited in that uh, tunnel vision, you know, that's kind of like a step. And then I felt 
for my own healing, working with, yeah, be it holographic kinetics or this other amazing uh, shaman woman I've been, um, who just came per at the perfect timing again, right? And my life helped me to work through in my own embodiment process and clearing energy. So it goes, everything It's kind of that holistic approach, right? Yeah. That's on the psychological, mental, emotional, you know, energetic level. Well, that's the other thing is too, sorry. Well, I just wanted to miss, miss say something quick too, because a lot of um, psychologists in the regular therapies, they don't understand the, uh, let's say the MK ultra programming or the ritual abuse or the high occult level programming that takes place or quote alien abductions and astral abductions. And then the things that are done on these subtle levels to actually program and influence people so that they have a lot of these issues in addition to just like regular trauma, you know? So, um, so they're mistaking things and misdiagnosing people actually. Um, calling them psychotic when really they are being abducted. So it's, yeah. I think they need to have more information about what's happening and be able to still apply good old fashioned psycho psychological trauma resolution and support, but knowing, okay, wait a minute, they'll be able to assess what that's programming. I could tell that that's programming right there and they'll be able to, to identify it and know that it maybe it doesn't come from the parents. It comes from something else because they were put into a my lab program, for example, but most, most psychologists, they, they wouldn't know that they're just not trained to, to recognize those things. The key, what I see also with Ariella said, you know, especially in the spiritual community healers and all that stuff, new age, whatever, or even psycho psychology, we cannot expect much because it's the mainstream, but I realized you know, my own healing process going to, you know, sometimes we need help. You know, we cannot always do the self-work on our own. Sometimes we need guidance, reflection, or healing, whatever, on, on, on various levels. But as especially in the so-called spiritual community, and I don't know, or the new age, and it's hard to define what the new age is these days. So, you know, maybe we should even make a definition because I've been called new age because I do body work, which is ridiculous. So, but, um, you know, what I see is the lack of understanding of the hyperdimensional control mechanism and the dark side of that, you know, agenda and, and that we're not on top of the food chain. So, food chain. so anybody who doesn't know that will always interpret any, you know, um, disease or illness or whatever they're helping a client with through their limited reality and then become even conducts of negative entities uh, working as positive ones, right? Which we see in the channel community and all of that kind of stuff, or even in basic terror reading where people get to terrorists or psychics, they become instruments of these negative entities when they are not aware of it. And then even putting two people together in the love bite scenario. You know, most people go to psychics and terror reading for relationships questions, right? I mean, that's, I think. <laughs> exactly. Actually, there's people who are willing to pay a lot of money every single day or every week to get a tarot reading and to know what's going on and all that. Instead of paying that money, maybe to go and, f and figure out why they are so eager to get that person, right? Right. Very good point. Yeah. The other thing too, is that I like, I like what everyone's saying about having clinical psychological um, therapy in order to get to the core wounds and combining it with the spiritual knowledge and with the knowledge of the, these hyper dimensions that are utilizing everyone in so many different ways so that we can recognize what's going on in our own lives. The danger, however, sometimes is when a person knows that they're possessed and they know that they're, they have these traits and they're doing damage that sometimes they can use that as an excuse as well. So really what it boils down to is at the end, the more knowledge, the better, but the person just needs to have to want to do it on their own. And they really need help without excuses and justifications for their bad behavior, behaviors that are damaging. So that ultimately is is huge so and, and there are i just like to add something there are telltale markers which differentiate whether you call it the alien love bite or the dark side of cupid etc from normal interpersonal relationship issues and you know eve has done a lot of work in this regard and she's she's listed a number of these these uh these aspects for example, shared dreams. Uh, and when we're operating on that energetic level where we're in the same dream pool, if you will, with another person, 
all of these uh, connections are intensified. So when one begins to have shared dreams with the other person, when one begins to have shared psychic experiences, almost to the point of telepathy, where they not only can uh, feel what the other person is feeling, other person is thinking about me, they're feeling sad, something's going on with them, I need to call them, right? Uh, there's a whole laundry list of, of these kinds of symptoms, uh, symptomology, if you will, like another very common, at least in the old days, uh, scenario would be that the two targeted individuals would find themselves either in a very real, seemingly real stage managed dream or in an actual environment where they seem to be in like a hotel room setup where there's like a double wide bed, there's white bed sheets, there's the uh, stereotypical hotel room lampshades and lamps, and they're there and they're expected and they may get uh you know the arousal mechanism activated between the two and they may begin acting out and and uh having intercourse whatever the case may be so th these are things that differentiate what we're talking about from quote unquote average normal interpersonal uh relationship issues there there's a supernatural if you will a spiritual uh dynamic which which tends to intensify all of these feelings and again we're, we're, we're resonators of, of emotions and this is all about energetic harvesting and emotional harvesting so the, these our contact parasitic beings have no qualms about doing whatever it takes to rev up these emotions within us whether whether it's through technology uh, like tom was pointing out earlier technology through, through uh, a frequency modulation, uh, energetic or, or physical implants, whatever the case may be, our emotions could be dialed up and down on, on a whim. And, and so people have to understand that, that, that this is a dynamic that it, if one were strictly to look at it from a psychological standpoint, they would come up lacking. And, and the irony is if we're one to go to a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, if they misdiagnose you, then you wind up getting plugged into the psychiatric tyranny where you they load you down with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, psychotropic drugs, and that just destroys cognitive function. It opens you up to even more energy attachments and, and cords and, and, and everything else because it's all tied in. So, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to throw that out that when, when the listeners and the viewers here is talking about these supernatural elements, that's what's going on and, and all of it tends to accentuate and exacerbate all these feelings all these emotions all these emotions all this turmoil and and, and further t tends to embed us energetically to that other person yeah i like how they use that term embed energetically because i think that's exactly what happens there's there's a, a stronger link and then it doesn't come undone even when you want it to and you still have this link to somebody else but i think part of like quote the love bite is that there's many many factors involved to exacerbate the connection including alien implants or some kind of energetic implants or blocks as well as programming as well as quote entities so there's there's several aspects involved which i think if we wanted to heal from these things we have to take that into consideration but at the same time not deny the basic psychological wounding we have made had or unmet needs and be able to take responsibility for healing on that level because what i'm finding is that i get a lot of people claiming oh i'm a targeted individual and so they're blaming everything on being a targeted individual and they're they're not taking responsibility on a lot of different levels that they could or they don't may not understand because their their information is only coming from a certain forum that only talks about it in a certain way and they're not getting the whole breadth and depth of what really happening to plus, apply the, plus the entities don't want them to take control oh, of of course not. the entities want them to be in denial the entities want them to justify their bad behaviors even even if they know that they're possessed like oh no well the entity made me do it so that it, it's huge level of manipulation by you know puppeteering so as to not control to not take control that's what they don't want yeah so maybe at this juncture we can actually take a take a little bit of a break
and then when we come back we can maybe go into more elements of how to heal from this and the therapeutic interventions we can do for this and also a little bit about you know what's a positive relationship versus what's a setup so that we could actually be clear on that and not feel victims to all this because really we're not we don't have to be so anyway just wanted to point that out and then um, we'll come back in about 10 minutes so okay okay um so we're back and we want to talk about some of the elements that really um i guess help bind people together in a stronger bond and one of the things that we came across um especially in mill labs but abductees too um in the pre-bonding they do this many times throughout our life um and then it'll be under sometimes traumatic situations or many different emotional extremes or situations and that actually serves to strengthen the bond um, but not only that um, is when they astrally and energetically bind you together and melding and what do you call astral sex or like soul unions that happens and that actually has a more profound effect on bonding than even physical sex that um, and that that alone could be done and creating that kind of a connection so that when you do meet the person or let's say you do have a relationship with them when you're with them you remember it's like you know you know their body you remember everything it's a body memory to know everything how they would make love everything it's just like you know everything you know you've been with them before but you can't place the memory it could be like a powerful deja vu but it's it's a body sensation it's a, it's a recognition even on that level so and and undoing that and i think the the problem with undoing from the obsession is because the bond is so strong that you really just have to let go and uh, make sure that you you get your needs met you take responsibility for the healing of what you need to do for other areas of your life and that could be you know working out the abduction stuff really clearing out the programming if there's programming there and you know james was talking about this on our break and how we can disengage from that so that we can set boundaries actually physical boundaries is helpful to set physical boundaries although nowadays we have so much of the technology and the internet and texting and facebook that in order to disengage you really need to disengage even from those means because even engaging on facebook and email is is a way to keep the link so i'd say that disengaging long enough to, to regain your energy and your your confusion factor will start to dissipate so you start to recognize what spell you were under because really when you when you're bonded there's this energy vampirism thing that could take place too if the other beings responsible or feeding off of it so that means your awareness could go by the wayside you you fall under a spell and you may have confusion and self doubt and you just get so caught up in it you lose your awareness so you have to disengage from that person long enough to regain your composure regain your energy and your awareness and then start working on your stuff basically and I think what you're saying, Evie, correlates because all of this, all of these setups always go back to your original setup. Yes, and your original wounding too. And your original wounding. So it all takes you back to the original setup. And those are the setups that let follow you until you finally unplug from it all and, and attach the reality of what your core issues are to your current paradigm yeah because it's always related it's always related to the beginning oh absolutely the first setup. yeah and no, i know that's, it's, it's that's really interesting too. laura what you said about the, the core wounding you know i can see that in my own life beat with love bite scenarios or other issues or even attacks publicly i've received whatnot that always triggered guilt and shame within me you know, just diminishing myself, always this solar plexus, third chakra, which is like the self-worth, the will, you know. So that was always triggered. And like I was even basically, what I was behind it, not uh, <clears throat> diminishing my own trust into myself, be it even engaging with certain groups and people. And I see red flags, but not really trusting because they must know better and, you know, and all these kind of things. I'm not trusting my intuitive uh, insights when <clears throat> doing a love bite scenario even while it was happening or even just before it was happening but not truly trusting that deeper intuitive knowing which i also want to point out it's not just <clears throat> like if not just an emotion but it's really like a deeper embodied knowing like there's actually clarity in these moments you know 
but then the programming or whatever uh, kicks in the you know not trusting that the emotional override the sexual override all of that and the confusion you know and then sometimes relates what also relates to gas like being gaslighted you know that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know blaming you or questioning your own experience mm -hmm. right and projecting it back onto you and the altered states i mean yeah. i have an experience where literally they induced so much melatonin in my brain in the middle of waking like i have a hard time sleeping as it is melatonin is not in large amounts in my brain but when they wanted to knock me out when i was coming to realization and really suddenly i i was flooded flooded with melatonin and i just you know would almost just passed out unconscious so they can cause things like this in us they can induce chemicals in our bodies in our hormones or our adrenals you name it and and manipulate us and then our alters step in because a lot of this is is it's all altered states that we're operating under without knowing it so and they can induce any chemical they want including including the you know the desire to want to be injected by it when love equals equals pain it's like you're in this and love equals pain that's not logical i mean there's always some some pain associated with love but but this is a love bite and it's pain yet we stay in it i mean these are these are things that they're doing to our bodies and our minds and and chemicals so the question is now you know we know how do we protect ourselves from that you know how do we like what you know because i feel like you know and you guys should sure i'm sure can raven and um, people first get into this topic i see a lot of people becoming very fearful you know like paranoid like oh my god they have control over everything our thoughts emotions what's going you know like you know i feel it's really it's really important to understand that we are way more powerful than what how they make us believe we are right so that we have our own sovereign power to counteract it to protect ourselves which my experience relates to embodiment and frequency to anchor this not in a new age would talk a higher frequency in the sense of like just thinking positive thoughts and always being loving and light <laughs> but it, it entails actually understanding the dark side and evil like knowledge protects as well so there's a part of it is also gaining knowledge educating ourselves and you know for the listeners we can you know all of us have our work published in many ways and they can learn from it so that's part of that uh <clears throat> Education is, is part of the healing as well to understand that, but knowledge is useless if it's not applied, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, absolutely, like what you're saying about um, that they're not all powerful. And I mean, a good example of this is the fact that me and Tom are still together in each other's lives. And the reason for that is because both of us had access to Eve's work um, prior to things happening. Um, so, Yes, they can do a lot of things like they, like Laura's talking about. They can do all these hormonal things. I mean, the whole sleepy programming thing, and that's like a big one. They don't just do it when you're awakening to my they, they to uh, love bite. They do it like in general. I, I talk about that. I have an article called interference on my website, and the whole sleepy thing. That's a big one that will happen to people when they're reading important material that stuff doesn't want you to read, and you just feel like, oh, I just want to go pass out and go to sleep. It's completely fake it's something they're putting on you it's like an overlay but just because they have these abilities to you know manage things like a stage show they're not all powerful i mean awareness and knowledge is everything and just knowing that this stuff is happening um and being strong enough with your own willpower and determination to override and question and and all that that sometimes is enough to get you through it and that's what happened with us we had the awareness that the, you know of the love bite through eve's book and just knowing that this could be what's happening here, that and that was a you know with with our own um, ability to push back that that's that's all it took you know so they could they were trying all these shenanigans like or, or it's like textbook it's like you run down the whole list like of, of everything Evie talks about in her book it's like they they tried everything and here we are you know 
You know, that's interesting on that note in terms of interference in Eve's book, because in one of my, you know, I think I've had two, possibly three love bite uh, type relationships or dark side of Qubit. And the second one around 2012, I was really already feeling something is off here. And then I remember, Evie, you just published your book on Richard Dolan's, right, the publishing um, company. And I ordered that book right when it came out. Even before it came out, I ordered it, and they were supposed to ship it to me. You know, right in the time, I had all these weird uh, occurrences in this relationship, but it never arrived. It didn't come. They didn't. They forgot the order. Even paid for it. It never came. So and then I also totally forgot about it. Then I got um, kind of sucked into this group I was associated with and <laughs> visited them and whatnot. So I just totally got on the back burner and and. And then, like in my the last uh, uh, dark side love by relationship, like that's when I'm like, I need to get this book. So that's when I ordered it from Amazon and finally got it and read it. And I was already aware of it because I read your love bite, uh, alien love bite book. But I was I was totally associating with all oh, these uh, abductees. I don't really fit the profile, so I didn't, couldn't relate. And then I was reading your book, uh, Dark Side of Cute. I'm like, oh my god! I was like underlining the whole book. <laughs> And, you know, I checked out all the symptoms. I'm on the top of the target group and this all clicked. But, you know, and I can also relate to interference of, you know, and I, I see this in many people as well, what you just said, Clarissa, about reading certain material and then you get sleepy or distractions like phone calls, other people distract you and you cannot get into it. You know, all of that. Yeah. And the overlay that you said is exactly what it is too, because <laughs> when these things happen, and and we were talking about where is our power and our sovereignty. Well, the last huge um, attack that I had, which w like filled me with melatonin, I, and I knew, but this relates also back to when they paralyzed me and whatever, and I knew it was an overlay. So as soon as you know that, and you know it's not actually real, it only becomes real when you believe it and you let and you give into it. Then, then it really like continues. But when you realize the game and how they work, then you know how to just not believe it and you eject it. So then, then you just come back to normal. You just come back to yourself, your own sovereignty. But it really, really is so seductively powerful because we're, you know, we base everything on what we feel. They know that. They rigged it in us. So because we feel something, therefore we believe it. Yeah, that's a, that's a big yeah, so the, the emotional addiction component. Uh, oh, go ahead, Tom, sorry. Oh, no, um, I was just saying that the whole lack of self-awareness and self-correction, mm -hmm. that's one of the big underlying problems that allows these things to occur, right? Because it's not, it's not always that they are omnipotent, you know, and able to override everything. It's just, it's just that we are so weak because we're not, we're not actually utilizing our free will and applying it, you know, because if, you, if you're not aware of something, I mean, to take the strongest man on earth, if he's not aware of something, of, of a mouse, right, he's not going to be able to do anything about it, right? So, you know, it's that whole, like, sleeping giant syndrome that we have. And, um, yeah, once you become aware of something, at that point, there's only energy and willpower that still stand in your way. And that's one of the reasons why they, they do try to zap your energy. Uh, and there's just many methods that they can use for doing that. Because, yeah, because if your uh, sleep deprivation is one, another is having someone in your life, or just having entities around you uh, set up in your apartment, you know, at, at the etheric level, they can um, actually plug into your etheric body and start siphoning off uh, energy. So that, that can also cause a person to get gradually weaker and sicker and more tired over time. You know, then that's a typical inf infestation type situation. Um, but yeah, so once you become aware of it, so, okay, ignorance, lack of energy, and lack of willpower. Those are, uh, my book, those are one of the only three things that keep people trapped. And if they can get over those three things, then they can buck pretty much almost anything. Yeah, the willpower is like really important. In fact, that's one of the things that actually connects you with your highest power is the will. And, and you, if you just want to do it and if you just want to heal and if you just want to be able to be willing to, to know that, okay, maybe I have some blind spots. And it, it's kind of like a humility and a willpower that, that connects you with the spirit, your higher power to actually take charge and start showing us what the truth is. 
And so, but the energy thing is definitely important. I think that's why we need to disengage and set boundaries from, let's say, the love by a person or somebody who's trying to distract you. So you could have at least some peace and some solitude enough to rebuild your energy and awareness so that you could start really connecting more with that spiritual component. And that's really important. It's, it's the willpower and the ability to be humble. And I, what I find is that a lot of people who aren't, they're not doing their work because they're not getting humble enough to, to be willing to say, hey, maybe I have some blind spots, but they're wanting to blame, 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 blame. Or um, they're just not dealing with their stuff because they're so run by, you know, programming or fear or whatever it is. So really willpower is, is so important and it's, it's all you really need. It's interesting that you, you know, will, uh, about willpower because you mentioned your book, uh, Dark Side of Q, which I've experienced as well, which I said before that they tar the, the solar plexus, the third chakra, which is the sense of will, your own willpower, basically, oh. which they try to sap to like diminish you, like you're not sure anymore. And, yeah. you know, like with boundaries. So it's so true because in my experience, the hardest lesson in my life has been actually to say no without feeling guilty. <laughs> Or shame like oh my god i say no you know saying no without explanation having that boundary like you know and getting over that new age programming of just like always make nice and be nice and work things out and sometimes no and using anger because anger which also has been demonized uh, as negative in the new age using it because when you experience anger it's like you it's actually your body's experiencing a violation of the boundary yeah exactly that has an energy to set your boundary you know to kind of like back the fuck off this is exactly my actually that uh, something that happened to me when i finally decided to heal from all this uh, is uh, uh that in my dreams i was able to wake up in the dream that's something that i was reading on on evie's blog uh that it's a technique and it's very useful but it happened spontaneously i was not actually uh learning how to do that but i remember i started saying no well this has to stop i have to heal i have to empower myself i have to stop uh, being fearful of these entities and um, when I was going to bed in, uh, in the night, I was very uh, scared of the dreams, you know, and the, uh, I had nightmares and all that. And finally, I was able to wake in the dream and, and I was even able to confront them because they were always staging these kind of uh, scenarios where, for example, some, I hate to see, for example, children suffer and they would put uh, uh, scenes of dead children and things like that to, to really scare me off or try to uh, recreate uh, fights with people from my family. And then one, one night I remember that I, I was like, stop, you have to think that this is a dream. They're staging you, they're here, they're staging the dream. And then I started confronting all the people who was in the dream and I said, where is the handler? Where is the person handling this dream? <laughs> Until I finally found the person, they kind of changed and I saw that they, they, they looked like a gray alien and I said, well, now you have to stop. I'm not going to fall for this anymore and you cannot meddle in my dreams anymore. And they were like, oh, okay. And basically after that, my nightmares stopped. That's, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. That's Great. It's funny you had that experience because I remember I was doing lucid dreaming practice for a while and then would, you know, do experiments on, okay, asking the dream quick characters, which ones were actually projections of me. And I was able to tell which ones were projections of me, but then there was always like um, in a watcher somewhere. And then, then I knew the watcher that was like the trickster was actually another being. It was like the stage manager, you know? So, and, and facing the fears is good too, if you can do it in a lucid dream, but it's hard to get lucid, you know, but that's one way to do it. Another thing that kind of relates to what we're talking about is uh, with the awareness and the willpower, just something really quick. And it kind of ties into this mentioned earlier about how do you tell a real relationship from what's going on with love bite is when me and Tom were um, first coming together um, we had a lot of interference in, in a lot of ways, but one of the things that would happen, um, which is one of the checklist traits of a love bite situation, is that we would feel energetically drained in each other's presences. So he would walk through my front door, because I, I had my own apartment, he had his own apartment across town. As soon as he would walk through that door, I would just feel sleepy and just drained, and it was happening to him too. But we didn't know because we weren't talking to each other about this. But that's one of those things, and it creates paranoia, especially when you have awareness of the love bite. Now we're like getting paranoid about each other, like, oh, this could be he's, he's bad news. You know, I feel drained when I'm in his presence. But guess what? He was feeling drained in my presence too. And then there was one night where we were, uh, he was going to come over, and we were going to hang out. And I just, it was like I shut off. And I, I decided I don't want to hang out with him. 
and I couldn't even tell you why. There was no logical explanation for it. I just felt like I don't want to hang out with him. So I canceled. Now I have things I got to do, blah, blah, blah. And then, so the next night we were going to hang out and I was going to do that again. I just felt like I don't want to hang out with him. I'd rather just sit here and read my book and not be with him for no reason. He'd done nothing, but it was like I was shutting off. But I realized too, this is a love bite, you know, one of those major indicators. So I overrode that urge to just cut him out and like, no, we're going to hang out. So he came over and I did what most people aren't willing to do in a relationship, which is I put this out on the table. Like, let's talk about this. Like, let me tell you what I've been experiencing, you know, the energy drain. And then I felt like I don't want anything to do with you. And I just want to cut it off. And then he revealed that it's all been going on with him too. Like he was, or he got a nurse to get back in his car and just drive back to Iowa and, and leave. And, but he was overriding it and, and not just acting on it. So we both were doing, going through this. And as soon as we started talking about it and putting it out and then putting the light on it, it evaporated. So my feeling like I didn't want to be around him, it was gone. Like I was back to normal again, which is how I can tell that we are actually, we do have a true connection. Um, it's in our situation. It's, I think we're two people who were supposed to be together and there's indicators of that. I haven't gotten into like on a, you know, a higher level, there was indicators that were here with like a plan. Things are supposed to do together and the negative forces kind of tried to sabotage that. And then, became, you know, meddling in the relationship, creating artificial love by interference, you know, just trying to distract and then break us up. And, but as soon as we, we put it on the table and became aware, it would go away and revealing the true nature of the relationship, which is um, that, you know, there is a true connection there. Yeah, yeah. It, it happened to me too as well. Uh, actually, I would like to share that because it happened with my, my current partner and I. Um, before that, I had the love bite experience with the black magician. And I had those dreams where they told me that he was my twin flame and I had to be with him and we were going to do a mission and well, the works. And uh, basically, it, it never happened. Uh, my intuition told me to, to get out from that and uh, it was very ups and downs and all that. And then I, I found my, my partner and uh, it has been the contrary. I started having dreams where they were telling me, he's going to do this to you, he's going to hurt you. And then in the dreams I would see him, but he was acting like a psychopath. He was uh, hurting other women and beating children. It was so extreme that I said, well, maybe people get confused because they say, I have the dream where he's acting like that. Maybe it's a, it's a warning. Maybe they are telling me to get out from the relationship. And just like Carissa, I, I always felt like, uh, you know, maybe I, I should not continue with this relationship. I should break it up. But I had no reason because he was not acting mean to me. He was not attacking me or anything. So I think there is some kind of reverse love bite here also. They are trying to disrupt true love. And also what I see with, with uh, friends and ladies in the Twin Flame group is that they try to stage the love bite first before the true, let's say, soulmate or the true connection comes in. So what happens is that I have friends who said, well, I'm so much in love with this person and that person is completely narcissistic this, and uh, it's not a good person with them and all that. And then um, they part ways and they, uh, she finally finds a good person who treats her nicely, uh, who really wants to help her and he's spiritual as well. And she says, no, because my twin flame. Everybody there? Hello. Did her audio cut out? Because it was cutting out just at the end. Did it? Yeah. Ariel, are you there? Yes. Are yes, you, I'm here. You just muted, just muted yourself. Okay, that's why. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that the, that that is happening. They are trying to stage people who are not uh, really connections uh, before the true one shows up. That's that's something very common I see also in the, in the ladies in the, in the group, and they really get stuck. And then the other guy comes in and he's really nice and he's treating them well, but they're stuck. So since, since we're on the topic of twin flames, I like to get into that, but kind of backtrack a little bit because it ties into like more uh, a deeper issue, which we mentioned before. And like Tim, uh, Tom noticed it as well, that the underlying, um, you know, a reason why we fall into these traps, so to speak, is because we don't, trust our intuition on some level, right? Our inner knowing, the red flags, which, you know, call spirits, 
nature, whatever, is spirit is always talking to us and give us guidance and sim in forms of symbolism or intuitive impressions, bodily sensations that, you know, uh, if we're truly embodied, it's always there. So if we don't trust ourselves, then we get, you know, I see to speak out of my own experience, it's, you know, if for the reason I didn't trust myself, didn't listen to my intuition, I got myself in this relationship. So I take responsibility for that you know, until I get the message, how often you have to t pick up the phone until you take, get the message. Right. And, but I see the same now, you know, in terms of, especially in this day and age, there's with the internet, so much information, people are like out of body in their mental body, like getting information from the internet, just chatting, being on forums. That's all this mental energy, constantly looking for information or outside themselves, not, not having their own sovereign authority, authority within themselves. Right, and we know. I mean, this information age, people can learn a lot. It's necessary. It's great to to connect with people. But there's a whole dark side. There's a lot of disinformation. The new age, people hooking up on the internet, and then with the twin flame. What I see, I mean, I'm not as much involved as URL in in, in, in the community. But based on my experiences and having worked with people uh, one on one, like there's a lot of be you know, I guess mostly women, but also men as well, who then use the whole twin flame idea as like as this extreme romantic projection of the perfect partner and it becomes a complete distortion and it's just like anything else of looking you know for that white knight you know who's going to save the day so to speak and what i found you know it goes it actually ties similar into another topic like which maybe some of us can relate to about higher density beings incarnated in this day and age for a certain mission profile you know bauer messiniak's work you know, the family of light or the wanderers, you know, and star seeds. And there's maybe some truth to it, right? We can maybe um, relate to the profile, but I also see a lot of people is this identification with that label, you know, like, oh, I'm this, I'm that. I'm like, now I'm, you know, special or just then distorted or the identification of the twin flame. They get so fixated on the image of the twin flame. Like, I mean, I'm like, Chris, I mentioned it, I think, in our introductionary talk last week and with Laura, I don't like even the word twin flame anymore. You know, it's just like, you know, if there's a genuine deeper connection soulmate, however you, wanna, you may want to call it, it will happen and reveal itself in the own time as long as we st stay true to our path, do the self or gain knowledge, like in the example with, with Tom and Carissa, it happened without the need of this twin flame box attachment, so to speak, right? So... I, I mean, that's just my own personal opinion. I'd, ra I'd rather have people get away from any of these labels and identification and just work on the very basic level and working on themselves, gaining knowledge, working their path, tr learning to trust themselves, their own intuition and their own inner knowing. And that will then bring people together who are meant to be together anyway. Exactly, Bernard. That's, that's very important. You're saying that... Uh, became a label actually i speak to you basically initial because all these twin flame came from uh, elizabeth claire prophet she used to be a guru and a cult teacher she had a call with her husband and she was also promoting the i am presence uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you have heard about that well the i am presence is basically the higher self and um, uh, it was one of the first uh, ones to hijack the soulmate concept and it made it more complex Basically, what she says, I'm going to read from, from her website, it, it says, the twin flame or perfect love is born out of the original white far ovoid. This is an ovoid of light in which you are created in the central sun, the highest concentration of pure spirit in the universe. God takes the ovoid and he makes out two spheres of light, and each sphere looks like the causal body in the upper portion of the chart of your real self. We descend into the lower octaves, we separate from our twin flame. We lost that physical manifestation of the divine counterpart in heaven, and then we began creating obligations with other partners. And this is why embodiment after embodiment, we were married to different people. Some may be soulmates, some karmic relationships, and hopefully we will be able to do the best and share a love that will achieve a particular purpose and also balance karma. And the goal is to balance that karma, become purified on the path of the Holy Spirit, attain reunion with God and the twin flame, and climb back up the ladder 
of life to the source when you see that Elizabeth is clearly making the distinction between twin flames and soulmates, uh, leaving soulmates as something that is in between partners and until you find the twin flame and that the twin flame is the highest award you can ever expect. And this is what makes women and also some men to cling so much uh, to this concept of the twin flame as, you know, the perfect love and not being able to be with anyone else. And um, basically when, when uh, she printed her book, she was offering teachings on how to connect to the higher self and to the twin flame. And which uh, the first step is doing some kind of meditations. And I think, uh, I think it works by granting permission to be interfered when you do these meditations, because the entities also, I think they also need to respect in some way free will. And if a person does a meditation, maybe that means that they want to get in touch with these entities. So of course it's a deception and they pose as a higher self or they pose as a twin flame, but basically there has to be some kind of new age activity that triggers your consentment to, to be interfered. So that, that maybe ties in with, uh... Maybe Tom, you can talk about it. And your Clarissa mentioned that before about false reality creation. Oh. Try to manifest. I mean, I see there's a lot happening. People trying to manifest the perfect partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. It's a, it's a big, it's a big issue because, um, I mean, because I mean, we all know that our minds are, are pretty powerful. You know, I've had experiences in my own life where I had to watch my beliefs and had to watch my emotions because they would actually attract in corresponding experiences in really improbable synchronistic ways. Now, you know, if, if, you're, if you're trying to manifest something pretty innocuous, like a, like a parking spot, you know, that's not a big deal. But once you start trying to apply that towards an actual partner that you're going to be with for years, you know, if not the rest of your life, that's a really big deal. And I think the problem that happens is if you want something at a time when it's not going to be good for you, like it's not in your in your best interest so like what if what if part of your pre-incarnational plan if there is one is that for the next five years you're going to be focusing on on these different projects and self-growth things right but you get kind of selfish and kind of lonely and you want one right now you want to have a boyfriend or girlfriend right now and you want it to be like this or like that and you pull it in so hard that you actually deviate off your optimal path okay and now the thing is like you know different people have have this ability to to different degrees depending on how much energy they have or uh, other variables that I'm not even aware of, but I think it's possible to pull in something that is so not allowed or, or that is not, not so part of the main timeline, I guess you could say. It's almost like you're pulling in this, this distant strand of the timeline and weaving it into the main timeline, and this thing that you're pulling in is, isn't even a 100% real reality because it's not even something that was originally supposed to be. So it's almost this... Um, this um, cut and paste kind of thing that doesn't quite merge, doesn't quite match with what's supposed to be. So it's a somewhat ir ir uh, irreality that you're, that you're manifesting. Now the question is, what is the energy that's inhabiting this irreal thing that you pulled in? You know, if, you, if you're gonna manifest someone, if you're gonna manifest someone, where did their soul come from? What was their soul doing before you manifested it to that degree? And then the question is, what if there isn't much of one or what if there is only a little bit? Now, in the actual examples that I've looked at, um, people have written me, you know, some, some examples that we've seen. And it doesn't have to be like partners. It can be certain friends or just people that you, that you pull in. Um, in the worst cases, what happens is that, enter, that, that person is almost like a, like a placeholder. It's like an empty vessel in a way. And not only are they animated by your energies because you're the one who pulled them in, but there's also an empty spot in there where something else seems to fill it. It's almost like, 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 like they're a finger puppet and if you got your finger there and something else has got its finger in there. And so they mirror you in extremely strange ways. It's almost like they're, they're a product. It's almost like you're having a dream and they're a dream character and some aspects of them mirror your own subconscious because that's part of the energy that you projected out into this, this quantum reality that caused them to manifest in the first place. But there's always something strange about them in that they're not just you, there's something else too. And these, these characters, I don't even have a name for them because this whole phenomenon isn't really being discussed too much, but whatever they are, um, they tend to be very prominent vessels for dark forces to work through, to get at you. And part of the reason for that is because, as Aurela said, there's a permission aspect, you know? You, you, you signed your name on, on the ledger of reality saying you wanted this to happen, and even if your higher self and even if your intuition said, oh, that's not a good idea, 
he did it anyway. And so it's almost like giving away your free will. And so now these other entities that are kind of like lurking around the edges of the whole metaphysical protection bubble, these entities are looking around and say, okay, well, he signed his name there. He created this, this empty, this, this vessel, basically rolling out the red carpet for them to kind of come marching through. And uh, so, you know, the whole permission thing, that's another reason why these, these, these characters, I guess, uh, why they can do what, what they do. So yeah, the whole reality creation thing, it can have positive, it can have positive effects. Like in the case of Chris and I, this is a, you, you want to mention that or maybe? Ah, uh, what? Well, well, the, well, the idea, how we kind of that Oh yeah. See, cause, um, apparently in late 2001, I had a moment where I was, um, just kind of laying around and I was thinking, Oh yeah, I'd like to have a boyfriend. It's kind of the same thing I did before, but this time not so you know and yeah. there's no candle involved i wasn't like oh Arr. it was just, just thinking this like oh yeah like i have a boyfriend it was, it was like like an earnest kind of innocent kind of thought yeah or? it was like true reality creation the way actual true reality creation operates where i had a thought about what i'd like i was very specific kind of had my uh, criteria i was kind of looking for there was a little bit of an emotional tent to give it some like a, to nudge it but without that obsessive intense thing where you're trying to pound a square peg into a round hole and then I just put it out of my head I didn't think about it after that so um, it was true reality creation as it usually works for me I can't speak for everybody else but anytime I've manifested things in life that have been positive that's the way it was done it's almost like a recipe for how you do it so I did that it was late 2001 um, it was September 2001 and it turns out the same week that I did that and had this whole thought he, Tom did too and it may have even been on the same day that's what's really weird about it it was like literally the same week and you had your thought right yeah yeah basically i was just thinking about it in a, in a pretty innocent way i wasn't trying to do anything ritualistic or, yeah. or yeah. trying to make it happen out of desperation or anything i just had this kind of uh you know this, this stray thought thinking about you know it'd be nice to to be someone that was in my my peer group who i was perfectly compatible with that that, that was the exact thing that i intended for and uh, looking back on it now. Oh, and within huh? a week, that's when we crossed paths. Yeah. So it took like a week. Um, and then that's when we crossed paths. So. Yeah. Now, in this case, I think it was a case of two individuals who, in my case, we might have probably had had um, some sort of a past life connection. Which or, I, I've had indications of. So, yeah. yeah. So in, in between life stuff, where we might have had planned to possibly cross paths in this life. But the thing is, I think once you're incarnated here into this, this, this realm bubble, um, sometimes it might help to, to nudge probability from within it. Yeah. Or like, or let's say that there's some interference happening, trying to keep two souls apart. And in, in our case, we did just enough of the reality creation to kind of make the penny drop to so make sure that it did happen here you know, that our past did cross. So it's interesting because in this case, it worked out for the positive. Whereas in other cases, if you if your intentions are impure, if you're really obsessive about it, if you can resort to almost black black magic level things, and you go against your your destiny and your intuition and all that, then that's when things go horribly wrong. Now in our case, there was, there was no intuitive warning. It was more like an expression of our very hearts, like that is what we're supposed to be doing. And I was asking for what was already basically predestined in a way. That that always just came to me. It seemed to be like in the perfect moment time in your yeah. lives both at the same level of like just whatever you've gone through and then you maybe almost like what you try to manifest it was also maybe just a mirror of like oh this has just happened naturally you're tapping into that mm. you know path of the higher self what it has in, had in store for you that's why maybe the synchronistic and then, and then it all kind of just came together in a natural way it was like even after we met each other i wasn't um I don't know, it, it just, just going with the flow of things, not trying to make it work, you know, and all that. And the other thing is like with my ex, the one who I manifested through negative reality creation, that car accident that happened the very next day after doing my little intention, um, I had in, um, what do you call it? An intervention, almost like, like some kind of a higher voice thing. Like when I was about to get in my car, it urged me to go back and I was leaving work okay, just why don't you just go back inside and, you know, talk to Edwin, who is my boss, just hang out with him for like five minutes. He's like my buddy. So like, go back inside and why don't you just go, you know, just for five minutes, just go talk to Edwin. And, um, and I stopped and I'm like pondering on this, but I'm like, why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense, you know? Yeah. And so then I overrode this thing that was trying to urge me to go back inside, got in my car and five minutes down, not even five minutes, it's just a couple minutes down the road, my car was totaled in an accident. And that put me on 
the course to be on that timeline that led to Steve. So it was like something was trying to, no, we don't want you on that timeline. And I didn't listen to it, you know? So yeah. that's a great example of that obviously was a negative thing. Nothing like that happened with me and him. Yeah. So, but you know, that's a good example of like, if this force could come in and, and, you know, try to petition you to not go, why couldn't it just prevent your car accident in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, well, why didn't, why didn't it manipulate someone else to not, not be in the pathway to, to create the accident? And of course, that gets back to the whole metaphysical law, uh, permission, you know, just, just the way things learn or operate in such a way to preserve your, your, your learning to some degree. I mean, there's that component to, to things. So free will, permission, you know, destiny, you know, all this kind of stuff. These are all the, the hyperdimensional variables that, that figure into what's going on here sometimes. Yeah, and there's, there's, I've, I've just seen in other instances that don't relate to the love bite where these forces that do try to intervene and help you out, they can only do so much um, in certain situations. Other ones I've seen where they can just flat out undo a no-no. Like that's just a complete flagrant free will violation of epic proportions. We can't let that happen, sorry. And they really can just and I, I have an instance I've written about on my website, but in other cases, it seems all they can do is just try to like convince you, you know, and that's all they can do. And, and I guess it has to do with free will and, and laws or how things operate or what they can and cannot get away with. So. Yeah. Because in one case, like a, like a major car accident, that's not supposed to happen, but some negative force is trying to make it happen. It's not like you, well, I'm talking about that, like a major one, mm -hmm. like that could actually kill you and then completely derail your. And, and that's where one of my had, I saw it was just completely undone. I mean, it was just reality. <laughs> like the laws of physics were literally bent to, to move the car over out of the way. Oh yeah. I just, yeah. well, actually it's happened twice. Then. Oh. There's been two times now um, where, yeah, yeah. So, but that's a whole other thing, but um, just to explain that they, they have certain things that they're allowed to do. And obviously there's limitations. And in this case, they were allowed to try to, try to keep me off that timeline but you know in the end i had my own free will and i just was like a freight train on a determined set of tracks and nothing was going to stop me so <laughs> um but yeah we didn't have any of that interference in us coming together but then after we got together and he actually you know i moved to florida and he came to be with me that's when all the love bite like most of it just it just kicked in full force you mean the anti-love bite or the well yeah, I mean, yeah. whatever the whatever that was, I was trying to drive us apart. Like all the things that they were doing, which is all the textbook stuff that Evie has written about. You know that you know your story. You know, kind of you know reminds me of like the difference between a love bite obsession and a true soulmate, whatever, like true soul connection. It seems when you're truly connected with somebody, it's more. It's not this obsessive emotional love, kind of like. Well, you know, Hollywood times 10, you know, romantic projection, but it's more like a sobering, you know what I mean? They're, I'm sure they're emotions, but like you said, it was just like, oh, you know, I'm going to check this guy out and I'm going to hang out. We're going to hang out and it's fine and good, but it's not like this obsessive compulsory component behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think back, like, it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> it's been the 14 years. Um, but, yeah, there were, actually, I, I guess some of the weird stuff was kicking in before we actually um, went, before we, we met up in Florida. And, um, there was almost, like, a, I guess, an obsessive component in some ways. But um, Yeah, but overall, there wasn't something that, that diminished my lucidity a lot. And we truly had a bond. I mean, we would have these hours long phone conversations where we're talking about all the woo woo subjects and just brainstorming things and bouncing ideas off each other, like a true connection. And, it, you know, like we're really actually connected on a soul level and intellectually and um, like a true friendship that, you know, was able to. Yeah, that that, that you're saying is true. It's, it's more like a friendship. I mean, it's, it's, of course, it's romantic and all that, but it's, it's more like a friendship. And, uh, I see that also with, with people who are staged, that sometimes the person they are staged with are, are completely in another, let's say, uh, awakening level. Uh, they are not really very awakened or they are in completely different beliefs. Like you said that uh, your ex was uh, um, mm -hmm. atheist. And so um, that's also something that is important because I think true, true soulmates, let's say, or a true connection, they have to be in some kind of same vibrational level. Yeah, we were. It was like we were, it just clicked and, you know, hours on the phone until my cell phone battery would die. And it was like, you know, just into the same stuff and, and you know, really like on the same level, you know, of um, our intellect. Yeah, it totally wasn't that, that whole thing about like, I don't even know you, but I have this weird compulsion to, yeah. you know, as, as we've seen some of these cases. Yeah. Or like in my case with my ex feeling hypnotically 
this weird hypnotic thing to be with someone that I'm not really wanting to be with. And then, you know, then when we are like intimate, I feel dissociated, you know what I mean? Which I didn't mention that before because I didn't really want to get into it, but just being just dissociated, there's just a lack of a real connection happening and it's completely obviously being force fitted. So. Yeah, what you said, Arella, is, is, is actually very important. The complete uh, difference of states of being, of levels, you know, that is overridden by the more romantic projection. But then you find out in the love by that's like, oh my God, this is like completely, in, in com, you know, not compatible. There's no foundation. You know, I think on, on that level where, where we are like on that level of awareness and awakeness, you know, relationship take on a whole different meaning anyways than for quote unquote normal people or whatever in the matrix, right? So there needs to be a really, um, which probably you guys experienced, a level of like un, unspoken understanding. You know what I mean? I mean, there can be differences, but where you're just really like on the same page about the deeper aspects of the world and, and reality. Yeah. Right. Well, I like what Carissa said about um, how things just flowed. And when, when she followed her own, uh, more like a, a spontaneous spirit nudging, and that and really knowing what that feels like and it's it's more subtle and it's more um that's that's how to know you're actually connecting with that part of yourself and then knowing the difference between the other compulsions that aren't aren't quite right but sometimes that's what it takes is is having it work for you and then looking back and realizing oh well that that was what was natural and spontaneous to my spirit and that's when i was really in the flow with my destiny with somebody i really is supposed to meet so it's really nice to have that and then compare it in your life so you can know. Because I think there's a lot of people who don't quite know. They're still confused about, you know, whether or not they're following with their spirit or they're, you know, they're following with spirit guide or something. And, and just to be clear on that. And I think that when I look back on my life, it's something that's always more natural and spontaneous. And um, you feel more comfortable and at ease with that. Or if with some, if you're with somebody, you feel more at ease with them. You don't, you don't have those anxiety and the compulsions and the obsessions. You just feel this ease of naturalness and connection where the spontaneity of your spirit could just be there because you can be who you are with them. And that's a, that's a good sign of something healthy. Exactly. And that is, and that is true that, uh, well, in my case, it, it happens that you can also get too paranoid or too scared. In my case, I was very scared because, uh, well, when I was married, my, my ex-husband, well, he was abusive and, um, he was showing traits of uh, being narcissist. And then, the, and then I had the love bite with the black magician. So I was very much like, I don't want to have a relationship ever in my life. I want to just stay single for the rest of my life. And then I found my partner. So I was very much, I, I know that I was projecting a lot of my fears. So I was trying to find sometimes the, the, the smallest thing to say, oh, it's a love bite. It's a love bite. I knew it and he has to go. And, Sometimes it was just a stupid thing, you know, that maybe that day he didn't call me at the time he was supposed to call me and I was already saying, no, no, this is not going to work. So that's so, something that also happens with victims of the love bite. They, they get very scared of trying again and they start thinking that everything and everyone is possessed or <laughs> so it's, it's difficult. You know, Arella, that, that's a very important point I see, you know, with people becoming more aware of this topic and actually accepting it, speaking out, you know, I see it, you know, in my work and, uh, and we see it on, you know, on Facebook, a lot of people are finally speaking out about this and sharing their experiences, but there is this paranoia at the same time. And I feel sometimes people project actually, first of all, don't really understand the love, any love by the dark side of Cupid topic. They're just bits and pieces, haven't really done the research, and then use it in a, in a way to blame their partner, you know, and then project this love bite scenario, dark side of Cupid scenario, into relationship patterns, which are actually just normal relationship patterns and don't have that deeper symptoms of the, of the love bite, right? And then again, like, yeah, like, like Ariel said, I also, you know, I work with people here and then, I communicate with some people, and there are some. Some, uh, some individuals out there, people, women or, or men, who are so paranoid, so caught up in the actual intellectual you know, timeline projection of fear of what may happen in the future, because fear is always related to time, right? You know? so, uh, so they s avoid any form of relationship. You know, they've been single for five, four or five years, don't want to get you know, cel celibate and all that kind of stuff, which is fine on some level, we all need to feel you know, be comfortable with ourselves first, right? 
I mean, there are two kinds of people. Sometimes people jump from relationship to relationship. They cannot be on their own. But sometimes people avoid it completely because a relationship brings up too much. And sometimes we just need to engage in a relationship just to, because just to deal with our basic stuff, which only comes up in relation to others. And not every, you know, not every relationship is right away a love bite. So while on the positive side of the increasing awareness of this topic, I see also the paranoia misapplication of this topic at the same time. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it happens. All right, yeah. can, you, can you tell, um, explain a little bit about the difference between your experience with your love bite, like your first, um, the one that you would say is the worst love bite versus the real thing that you have now like what are the what are the you know the markers that are the indicators that make it um distinguishable to everyone well actually they are very similar to tom and carissa's very very similar because the first one, it um, it felt more like stage because I had all these psychic things, you know. I had a lot of synchronicities with uh, with the name of the person, a lot of repeated numbers, a lot of dreams saying, "Yes, you guys, you have to be together. You have a mission." Um, all the well, you know, all the intense feelings. But there was still a background where uh, where uh, this person, the things that he was doing, I was like, "No, I cannot get into that because he was actually." Well, he was uh, selling some kind of dark magic techniques in order to manifest things, but they were basically pushing uh, black magic on people. So they were um, like saying, oh, do you want to uh, influence someone? Then you have to look at that person and address the energy in this way and brainwash that person. And then you have to burn a candle. And, well, it's what, it was magic. What, and uh, I was like, no, this, this doesn't go with my values. This is really not who I am. And they were pushing a lot. Yeah, that's a mission and you have to work together and you, ha you have to open a center to push new age uh, kind of teachings. And uh, it, it didn't feel right. And it came to a point where I, I said, well, uh, I really cannot go uh, against my values. And I spoke to this, to this person, to this guy, and he got really upset really upset because I started saying, well, what you're doing is black magic. You are harming people. You're making money out of, it, out of it. So I cannot be part of that. And he got really, really, really upset. He started blaming me. He started calling me, oh, but you're a nun. <laughs> you don't want to do anything wrong. And you are never going to make money like that. And well, he got very upset and he basically disappeared. But it was until I really set my foot down saying no. And this is against my, my, my values and I'm not going to do it. And in the contrary, when I met my partner, well, we did have synchronicities. We did feel the energy. Uh, we're very compatible. Uh, we, we have the same astrological sign, uh, which we were always kidding about that. We had a, a similar um, um, way of upbringing. Um, we were both very lonely when we were kids. Uh, we shared many, many, many things. And also, like Carissa said, it was hours, hours, hours talking on the phone. Uh, we finished each other sentences. Um, we want to do something to help people to, to spread this kind of information because uh, we have many friends who continue under the programs of, uh, of the New Age and they're suffering. I have many, many friends who are really suffering because of this, destroyed marriages and all that, and it really hurt us. And we have very similar values, so that's something that uh, to me it was a big sign. But at the same time, it was very difficult because I was carrying all my bag, you know, of wounds and trauma from the other two relationships to this one and uh, it was difficult for me to to uh, not think that maybe i was being tricked again and but uh, yeah there, there, it's a very fine line but but you can tell and but there also, weren't any conflicting behaviors yeah addictive no not really it was more addictive with with the other one with the black magician or Much conflicting conflicting behaviors like yes you know jekyll and hyde conflicting behaviors there was you know Nothing like that with your, your, um, the no, part. yeah, no, there, there were the you know the normal relationship things and things that we had to work, uh, and also, well, he was uh, very much, um, 
interfered uh, by entities. Um, he was very much into, into the new age as well. He was programming many things. He had different experience than, than I had. He told me that uh, he had two experiences with ayahuasca and in one of them he feels like uh, he, he got entity possessed, definitely. Okay. Because he was, um, well, when, when he took it, he was uh, moving weird and he started doing mudras with his hands. And after that, he started getting kundalini triggers and he started really changing his, his way of thinking, his values. And he says that he thinks that he was being programmed. So when I would come along, he would reject me because I had some kind of uh, values and things that I would not do. And, and, he, and he used to be like that. And then he started changing after the ayahuasca experience. Mm, okay. No, also, I was going to add that I um, was thinking, and I never really I guess thought about it until right now, but the idea that um, psychic connection with somebody, the synchronicity, um, I think on some level, it doesn't always indicate a love fight. Like we did actually have a lot of, we had some woo going on and it's a matter of untangling what was the artificial overlay and manipulation and interference and what was a natural connection because I really do believe that if you have, if you're infused with a higher spirit, you, you know, you're sold for lack of a better way of putting it, you should be able to psychically connect with the person. And the thing about my ex that I, I wrote about on, on one of my things was on my website was that he would always be able to read my mind. I could never pick up on him at any point. And the thing about me that defines me is I do have psychic inclinations and I could never pick up on him ever at any point, but he would definitely read my mind and, you know, and, but when you try to like point it out to him that he's reading my mind, he kind of frees up because he's such a hardcore atheist. And you know, that's like a slippery slope. You, you can't acknowledge anything that's woo woo with an atheist because it's just, you know, it'll, it's a slippery slope to having to acknowledge things that maybe prove that their atheism is wrong. But um, we did have psychic stuff and some woo woo. And, but I actually think it's good. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong in that, but I feel like we would, we would be psychically in tune with each other. And it's like, um, you know, the whole finishing each other's sentences thing. We couldn't even tell who thought the thought first. It was almost like our brain is like linked mm -hmm. up and that would just happen to such an extent as like, we're just such in the same frequency. And I don't think that's a bad thing and it doesn't necessarily indicate sinister things. I, I think I mean, in my case, I think that's actually a good sign. Yeah, well, I, I think, go ahead. I mean, I agree that you can have a good connection and, and actually really tune into each other with a positive thing and have it not be interference at all. And I wanted to make that point in my book, The Dark Side of Cupid, that even if they do have the magical, supernatural and telepathic, empathic thing, that alone doesn't necessarily indicate it's, it's bad because you can have a good connection where you actually have that and that's positive, I think, that can yeah. happen. I, I have even great uh, synchronicities and psychic connections just with regular friends on that level. You know what I mean? I think it's definitely not to be thrown out the baby with the bathwater. But the way I take it actually from your work, Evie, uh, is I think actually a combination of all the symptoms and not just taking one, you know, people then pick, you know, like, oh, it's synchronicities, mm -hmm. psychic, you know, bonding, whatever, there must be love, but no, it's a whole array that all need to fit together, right? With the compulsion, the emotional obsession and all of that, right? Yeah, it's pretty yeah, I, th I think that the synchronicities is, is, uh, can happen both ways as well, because I, I also was uh, seeing repeated numbers with, with both relationships, I mean, and uh, also before awakening, then when I was awakening, and then when I deprogram, I continue seeing repeated numbers. So I think it can, it can go both ways. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I get the numbers too. And uh, with me, you know, it's been, it's been interesting trying to distinguish between what are genuine synchronicities and, and what are the artificial ones. And I mean, what it boils down to me is that these entities, the negative ones that are, that are doing this, they're, they're trying to simulate the positive. You know, but they can only simulate. They can't actually achieve it. So when they do it, it's, uh, it's kind of hasty. It's, it beats you over the head because they have to compensate for you having your intuition, right? <laughs> so they have to like, take it to a, to a higher level. And therefore, it comes out kind of disjointed, kind of artificial, uh, trying too hard. I mean, it's like when you get an email from a friend, right? How do you know the difference between that and, and some guy in Nigeria wanting to give you money? How do you know, right? Well, this guy's gonna, he's, your friend's going to lend you five bucks, but this guy's going to give you 12 million. Who's going to be better? Well, you got to be smart about that, obviously. So, you know, when you, when you have these, these artificial staged relations, you know, all the weirdness surrounding it, 
it's all the things that entities can do, but they can't do other things like the whole spiritual connection, you know, feeling at ease with someone like in an elusive way, not like you're, you're drugged up with morphine and, and then you oh, I feel great around this person. Well, it's not like that. It's like, wow, I'm really clear. I feel alive. I feel like more of myself. You know, you're not being squished down. You're actually being elevated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's another sign or another difference between the authentic and, and the artificial. Very good point. That was a good one. Mm. Well, yeah, so Paranoia thing. That's that's uh, yeah. that's, that's pretty dangerous. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it just takes healing. You know, I mean, the healing part is what really needs to happen so that we can fall into the spirit connection and um, feeling that sense of inner peace as opposed to numbness or avoidance. And when we can be in that place, then I think things are more natural to happen. But I think when people have the fears and the anxieties and the compulsions, it's because they, they haven't healed those traumas yet. But there's something that I think Bernard said that, that um, a lot of times relationships sometimes is the only way that we could really heal some of this, that we can't do it all in isolation, that we actually do need to interconnect and have relationships with other in, in order to heal even from other relationship issues. And that, that's something that I learned when I got my training is that, you know, we, we have to heal through relationship if we were hurt by relationship. We can't do everything in isolation. So I'm not the one to think that you should meditate for years and be in isolation and then, then you'll finally be good enough to, you know, be able to face the world. We just have to interact with each other regularly enough to, um, to know what feels right. You know, and I also feel everyone, on that, not everyone, but most people on some level, you know, yearn for a relationship for the perfect partner, Every, you know, love, right? We, it's natural wanting to connect and to be with somebody on some level, right? It's, it's normal, but it's through our own, like, let alone any love, but in all this stuff, but cultural conditioning through Hollywood, you know, and, and, and all you know leading us away from our own inner knowing and feeling lack always seeking something or somebody ourselves to fulfill our wholeness so to speak you know we people don't get you know i don't take myself at the equation we may get into desperate situations and hook up with the wrong people and whatnot you know but sometimes you know that topic came up before i think tom talked about this or and carissa when we talked about a reality manifestation who knows what our, you know, the higher self has really planned for us. They're very, that's what I'm, in my work, what I've learned the most working over the 10 years with thousands, thousands of people on, on body work and also just personal processing. It's like everybody is so different in an individual, right? With their own unique soul lessons and karma to regard or gifts to develop. So for some people, you know, like it may even not in this lifetime that they're meant to be, that they're going to connect with the twin flames or whatever but they can have beautiful soul-made relationships, right? Or sometimes, you know, we need to go through a certain period of, with certain relationships before we can attain this higher, you know, conscious relationship and whatnot because these are the lessons we need to learn, you know? Or like, like sometimes we're meant to be more alone, like Tom said before, for a period of time before we can enter. But because we have lost our inner connection, our own connection to our wholeness, basically, which is our connection to spirit, our own sovereign self, then we, you know, always look outside for guidance and then, you know, get and project outwardly and just get information, especially in this day and age, get all this mental information. And that's what I notice nowadays with the internet. Everybody's so, the head is disconnected from the body, like on the basic level. And, you know, maybe I'm biased because I'm a body worker, but people are not really embodied anymore grounded. You know, it's almost the soul is not fully anchored in the body. And if the soul is not fully anchored, it's like, it creates holes in the aura, like where other entities can attach themselves to others, you know, to their frequency. And, you know, as long as we work on embodiment and this holding our frequency, then we are not subjected to these attacks that are not, are not even attracted to people who are, may carry these entities, right? Because we have, we are whole within ourselves. Yeah, exactly. There, there is a case I would like to, to share with you because it's, it's really relevant to what we are talking right now. It's this lady who I met also in the Twin Flame group and she told me that uh, she had a very good relationship with a guy and they were, actually she felt like they were Twin Flame soulmates, whatever you want to call. They were very good to each other. But uh, the guy got very much swept into the channelings and he said that uh, he was the incarnation of Ashtar. And, uh, well, he was very much into that. And uh, uh, 
then that entity started saying to him that uh, he had to, to leave this woman and that he had to get with another woman. And the guy was very much in love with the first woman, but he said, well, you know what, I'm going to have to leave you because um, um, I'm embodying the energy of Ashtar. We have a mission in this, in, in this place, in this planet, and I have, I'm supposed to be with my true twin flame. And the lady said, well, I thought that we were twin flames. And he said, no, no, because um, um, my, my higher self, this entity is saying to me that it's someone else. And he already told me who that person is. And I'm, I'm leaving you. And he left her. And now he's uh, with the other lady and they're doing uh, channeling work for, this, for these entities together. Wow. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I've heard well, that. They give them positive perks if they help them in their agenda. Like I've, I've heard that in some alien love bites where <clears throat> if they helped promote the alien agenda of a lot of the false positivists, new agey stuff, then they would actually set them up in a relationship where they got the positive perks out of it. But once they challenged the authority of these beings that, that were giving them messages, then all hell would break loose, basically. And the relationship would be destroyed or weird things would happen. So it, sometimes it works out if you help promote the agenda, you know. So how to deprogram, how to escape, how to deprogram, and then embark on healing. Watching those ego hooks of being a special messenger, right? Or an incarnation of who God knows. <laughs> yeah. I think something we mentioned, uh, I think Laura, you actually mentioned our last uh, Love, Ellen Love by the um, uh, webinar, which was also where you worked for me. I think we have addressed it briefly is about just starving them you know, not acting on these compulsions, you know what I mean? That's exactly. you know, really like not giving food to that, yeah. which is sometimes uh, harder, uh, easier said than done, but that's on the basic level what people can do, right? Not giving it's in to It's totally disengaging. Yeah. So once you start realizing, you start slowly disengaging, and this way it doesn't send off alarm bells mm -hmm. to the entities and then because that would create some another entirely different type of hoovering. So if you just slowly withdraw until the point where you create enough safe distance to unplug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Action. Very good. Because if you do it too fast, it activates the entity to pull you back in or to create another drama that you can't always disengage from because you're still in their game. And so it's really learning how to be like the perfect uh, operative on disengaging without really getting them too triggered and also understanding what agreements of entrapment are in operation um, through this relationship or through this connection. And sometimes you only know in hindsight, like, okay, now I realize why this happens because this was the agreement of entrapment that got this thing started. Okay, now I realize it, so I'm going to slowly disengage, but you have to do it in a way where it doesn't get the entity all triggered because it'll, it'll get triggered and they'll, they'll create a fight with you or a drama or a huge situation that'll pull you in and make you look bad. And it's amazing watching these things now. So it's really learning how to set those boundaries in a way where um, you don't mind, you know, just disengaging and then re-engaging with people who are more in alignment with the more clean, um, spontaneous spirit energy as opposed to the, the counterfeit. And you really have to know the difference because you know what it is inside yourself, you know. And also the engaging when it's the counterfeit, it's always surrounded by drama and conflict. Mm -hmm. and and creating anything to get you back in. So, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's, that's some good points that we could probably close with, unless there's anything else we want to bring up for the last like five minutes or 10 minutes. Is there anything one, else? One, one thing that came to me, I think we addressed it before, but careful of falling into victim consciousness. You know, which I think can actually just recreate the traps of agreement of putting yourself, oh, I'm just a big, you know, and then, you know, like gets self diminishment, basically, you know? Yeah. Also, well, I mean, the victim consciousness is huge. And I would think some people call it the learned helplessness, her learned helplessness programming, which was really um, described in the early days of the recovery movement when there was alcoholics and co alcoholics and the codependency, and how, let's say, the co alcoholic or the one who was, let's say, living with an abuser. Actually, the reason why they were always a victim is because of learned helplessness. They grew up learning how to not 
fight back. They just never could. So it's like, it's a conditioning that takes place sometimes over time. And you see that more in like adult children of alcoholics or women who married an abuser and was married for many years and they, they developed like learned helplessness. And so that actually just recreates the situation over and over. So it's really having to learn how to say no and set boundaries and um, do things differently and not, not do the yes, but yes, but it's always their fault. Blaming, blaming, blaming. Yeah. That gets really tiring. Let me tell you. So it's, Sometimes you have to hear some negative things about yourself in order to change course and get out of that victim programming. Which is learned codependency. Even if we've been in bad relationships, like, um, oops, sorry, we're on, okay. Yeah, even if we've been in bad relationships, there's always some part that we played in it, you know, and you got to take responsibility for whether it was your own naivete and, you know, youthful stupidness, whatever, and just learn from it, just get whatever positive you can get out of it, try to turn it into something positive and just move on to greener pastures, you know, instead of, um, you know, blaming everybody else and you're just a victim that's always being targeted. And, you know, it's not just the love bite, you see that, you see that with the, the gang stalking people, which we've all talked about, um, you know, that whole victim where it's just, they take no responsibility for whatever role that they may have played in things, you know, and even if it's just naivete or stupidity, just take stupidity, just take responsibility for that, you know, <laughs> and, and, and move on. And then just, I think that's the key and also distinguishing between, um, a person who you may think is, is your love bite, but may not be as well, if they're willing to take responsibility. You know, they may be more fractured than you. Either way, both partners are all suffering core wounds that, that stem, you know, into abandonment issues, all of it, like the, everything that we all feel. One will always feel it more, but I think the difference, the distinguishing factor will always come down to if the person really, really genuinely wants to help themselves and not, and not be a victim of whatever they're going through, whether they're like possessed or not, whatever is happening. It's, it's, it all comes down to them not wanting to be a victim of it and choosing yeah. to do something different. I think when they don't do that and they give into what is driving them, that is a sure sign that they are like definitely your love bite. Well, make them a victim as well. It'll, it'll recreate the victimization. Yeah. You know that. I just want to say there was the one thing that, that helped me in my life was, um, you know, I, I went through the process of like getting really, really angry and spinning in anger and blaming the other person and then, then getting angry and blaming myself and then trying to be perfect and, and that wouldn't work. And, and, and really what had to happen is I just had to grieve the loss of whatever was lost, which was years of my life. And then self-forgiveness, actually it was a realization that things couldn't have been any different considering the situations at hand. And that, that realization of knowing it couldn't really have gone any different and, and learning from all of that gave me the self-forgiveness and just the acceptance to, um, to deal with it and to not get caught up in it again. But it, it had to happen in a, in a real way where there was a, a deep realization that it really couldn't have been done any different. And I'm not saying it to justify the victimization, but it, it was a certain element of self-forgiveness had to take place after the grieving. So I think the grieving process is really important. And that's actually one thing that a lot of people don't want to do in the healing process. They, they avoid it like the plague. But really what we're dealing with is, is even if there's grief, it's, it's a loss of an illusion, but it's still grief. And it's still very real. Very important. I can relate to that, the grieving process and self-forgiveness, because I tend to be hard on myself, beat myself up. And even when what Carissa was sharing about her first uh, relationship, I, how she kind of felt like, you know, how you were beating yourself up or kind of looking back, like, how could I get myself into that? I have the same thing, but I need to look back. Like you just said, you'd be like, okay, this is just what needed to happen in that moment. My own naivety blind spots. It's just what, that's where I was at. Now, obviously it makes more sense. And I'm like, looking back, why didn't anybody slap me in my face when that happened? <laughs> Wake up. So, but that's how, I, you know, again, like I, I truly believe in the idea that, you know, there's a lessons in a sense, you know, and to help us if we can, you know, even Tom, you wrote about it on, on, on I think, the article, The Art of Hyperdimensional War, to utilize the entities as teachers, in a sense, because they do target our blind spots and weaknesses, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, when I talked about permission earlier, 
you know, when, when these entities do what they do, it's not, basically it's, it's a, how do you reconcile that with the idea that you might have some sort of a metaphysical protection system? How do you reconcile the fact that they can do certain things and yet we have, we're supposed to have protection in some case? Well, the reason I think that is, is because certain things are allowed if there's a potential for us to benefit in the end from it, a type of, type of benefit that wouldn't have been possible if we didn't, if we didn't uh, go through that risk, that risky situation. So, you know, a lot of times when these, these negative situations end up having a positive purpose in the end, it's, it's not because, oh, all along it was just positive entities creating this mess just to, just to get you to, to, to be more involved. No, I mean, it really was a dangerous situation. It's just that at, at, on, the, on the other side, part of it could have been allowed just because, you know, there was a potential for you if you do your part in being aware and kind of making it through in one piece that you can benefit from it. So like well, benefit in a major way where it just completely backfires on them. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, they, they enter into a gamble, which is if they succeed, then you become weaker, but if they lose then you become way stronger. So, and, and they, they, they risk helping you in the end if they don't succeed in their plans. That's, that's sort of the deal there. And uh, what that implies is that whatever negative situation you're going through, there might be a hidden doorway to a, to a bonus level, I guess you could say, you know, there's, there's a silver lining there if you, if you play it smart and uh, you know don't don't give in to 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 the manipulations. Nice. Really well said. Mm. Well, is there anything else that we want to? Well, add? If, if I could just um, give uh, let's say three in, in general, just to maybe a little bit wrap it up about uh, my experience is that uh, I would I would tell people basically number one, please avoid gurus. Avoid uh, the kind of people that might uh, indoctrinate you with a lot of information that uh, might be coming from entities, or which is not really true because there, there are many, many psychic gurus and people out there who are really basically, uh, well, playing games, mental games with people. And they're messing uh, other people's life and they're bringing a lot of uh, bad consequences and havoc with to, to their lives. So I would say trust more your intuition and not really that much what a guru or a, a niti that is being channeled or you have to really try to trust more your own intuition. And to do spiritual work, uh, I did a lot of uh, spiritual work of reconnection to my own soul, to myself. In my case, I did a lot of work also with Jesus Christ. Uh, I know that uh, some people might think that it's more like uh, some kind of uh, um, avatar or maybe archetype, but it worked for me. I just wanted to also throw that in and um, basically learning self-empowerment and not being so afraid of these entities because as, uh, as Laura said and Eve said, they are not that powerful. And also be careful of healers because often they're just utilized to re-parasite you and get you re-implanted for your, you know, dire mission <laughs> for the one that's connected to, you know, the Dark Lord and the mate, the love bite. It's, it is, it really does come down to exactly what you said, Areja, that it's, it has to come from within you, your, and that what Tom said, what all, Bernard and James, all of us, it has to come from within us. We have to listen to all our senses, our body, our intuition, what we really and, and and know the difference between the artificial overlay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was going to say, like, the intuition part. This is the one thing that's kind of difficult. I don't know if it's more in the Western culture, but everybody's so individualistic and self-driven that a lot of times people think, oh, I'm just following my heart, following my intuition, but really what's operating sometimes is, is what we call the overlay of the psychological defenses or the interdimensional beings or the programs running them. So it can be a touchy subject because sometimes you can see, like as a therapist, you can see, okay, I see something else operating, but they think they're following their heart, you know, and their, their soul, but really a, a deeper amount of healing has to take place. And, and the only way that that can happen is, is to be humble enough to be willing to really ask your deeper self by, by letting go, even temporarily, of what you think is absolutely right, but just to allow that to emerge in your experience. Because it will emerge when you're humble enough to release whatever's blocking that. It will come to you. So just know that. You know, that, that's a really good point because, I, you know, I also said before, we all agreed really trust and following our intuition, but it's also being misused or misapplied. 
inspiration in a new age, you know, or the saying, just follow your, just do what you feel like doing. Mm-hmm. That difference, you know, you tell a heroin addict to do just what he feels like doing, right? That mm-hmm. doesn't really help him. Or the idea of resonating, for example, you know, resonating with a certain teaching or book, but there's truth to it, but we need to tune our reading instrument, you know, what the information with our own discernment on all levels to what part of us is resonating with it. Maybe, you know, a program condition self. I mean, a lot of fundamentalist uh, Christians resonate with the Bible and that they, you know, feel really the truth in it and that the, the earth is only 5,000 years old. You know, we see the same applied in New Age how people resonate with a lot of very questionable channel material or other material, right? Just because it feels good doesn't mean it's true, for example. Right. You know? like That's the key, and the not feeling. Yeah. yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I mentioned with a friend that I spent some time with a couple of weeks ago was that I realized in hindsight that my fears actually saved me and that a lot of my fears were actually coming from my spirit and from my intuition, but I was judging myself and I was allowing others to judge me for being, Oh, fear-based this and that. But I realized in hindsight that it absolutely saved me. So now I, I listen to everything that I'm feeling and, and still just try to be open to, you know, if I'm, am I projecting, am I defending, you know, what's really going on here and really give it time to just, um, till I know what's really true. There's a feeling that um, in psychology, which you know, Evie, um, where uh, a person who is in dire, in a dire situation or feels like they're in danger, they have this sensation of this, this real, this real uh, fluttering. It's that, that real sense of, uh, of danger, even though you may not see what's going on, but yet it's, it's a subconscious response within you. And I say, listen to that. If you yeah. have that feeling, listen to that. That's a psychic um, attack. I've had love psychic fights don't listen to that. <laughs> love fights <laughs> don't listen to that. Listen to that. Yeah, you're right. Even, even if you feel euphoria and you have that, that like, fear, fluttery thing you can't explain, listen to what that is that is um that is a warning sign big one (laughs) yeah okay we did four hours yeah i think we're wow (laughs) (laughs) it's long enough it's time to close and and just thank everybody and i know there's things that we didn't even touch upon but uh, we could always save that for another another time and I just want to thank everybody who is on the panel with all their personal experiences and their in-depth knowledge. And this has been wonderful. So thank you. And um, yeah, thank you. Well, Thanks everyone. It's it was beautiful. To uh, do this with all of you. It's uh, and it's been uh, fun too. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. And trust me, it has been an honor to be with all of you because I was really following your work and you have been a lifesaver <laughs> really nice and Evie you have like you are like front line you, you've come up with uh, I mean before that I, where was any of this information really well thank you for Barbie and Barbie was the one who saved me so you know there was always somebody else before us you know yeah, yeah same we me too so we're just p- passing the torch yeah, and uh, I really got a kick out of this. Thank you for including me. In, uh, you know, we'll, we'll catch up later, but uh, take care. Okay. Bye for now. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good, night. Good day. <laughs>